hang on. Like, can I start it this time? Oh, sure. Yeah. And now Christine's introduction to, and that's why we drink. Introduced by M. Schultz. <laughs> I wanted to beat you to the punch, but for the last like month, you've been going, "Welcome to," and that's why we drink. Da 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 da. Because you go, uh. You're right. You're right. Just I'm introducing your introduction. I appreciate so. it. Thank you for doing that for me. And let's try before. again. Okay. Well, here's Christine's introduction of, and that's why we drink. Hello, this is, and that's why we, oh, Em already said that. Um, <laughs> this is episode 211. Okay, I did write that part down. And I have a, I have a big regret. What? We didn't change our names again. Oh, it's okay. And You're so, just going to call me poopy head again. Yeah, so a couple people noticed it. Only like three, which I was very disappointed. Uh, I, em and I were texting and Em said something like, oh, love you. I was like, love you too. And then Em, like 40 seconds later, was like, never mind. I take it back. And I said, why? <laughs> and they sent this this screenshot from Instagram of someone being like, Em's name on the YouTube video this week says M Schultz, a.k.a. Poopy. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I forgot I did that. But I was very proud of it because we didn't change our names. And I was like, people were so into that. And I, I was like, we were on a roll. And then we totally forgot. And you were being a big butthead that week about Lemon's birthday or something. So I changed it. That sounds right. <laughs> I, re- I remember also thinking right after we recorded that episode, oh, we forgot to change our name to something funny. And then I saw Poopy Head and I went, okay, that works. <laughs> <laughs> We've done it again. So, well, I'm, I have editing power again this week. So we'll see what happens. I, I look forward to... Uh, I, I imagine whatever my name is lets the audience know how nice I was to you the week up until your editing or the day or up just like editing. what mood I'm in because it doesn't really reflect it on you so much as it reflects on me and my attitude problem so <laughs> I wouldn't worry about like it reflecting on you it's mostly me and my well, issues whatever the title is I'm, I'm proud to own it as long as it's not too <laughs> disgusting or that I'm like lemon's best friend don't fucking put that well, okay. Oh, God. You okay. write that down, please. Um, speaking of, I don't know where, I, I was like, what can I latch onto here? I don't speaking know. Speaking of I, anything at speaking all. Speaking of literally anything, which is what we do, we have a live show that we keep forgetting to mention at the beginning of the episode. Yes. On February 26th. We're super excited. We're doing like a ticket giveaway that we're super excited about uh, on Instagram or on social media. Our lovely pal Jess, who does the newsletter and some of our social media, uh, is setting up this awesome uh, activity. I don't even know what it's called, but it's super cool and fun. Um, and we're we're gonna be like giving away tickets. It's gonna be great. So you can follow us at ATWWD Podcast, or you could just come to our show, which is yes. uh, on February 26th, right? Yes, February 26th. Also, for those of you, it is uh, gonna be us reading new listener stories that you can submit. Uh, for us to read on the show or during the live show, those live stories or those personal stories should be sent to ATWWD from our couches at gmail.com. Yes, that is correct. Also, Eva just chatted us and said on location live.com slash ATWWD. And she's double checking on that. But I think that is the ticket link. So come show up. It's what, 10 bucks. We're going to have a super good time. And I can't wait. I just want to get that out there before we forgot him. No, we have really have been forgetting. I feel bad because the last the last two uh, live shows we really, really, really like pushed it and like pushed. Yeah, and this yeah. time we're like, oh yeah, we have a live show, and now I feel like it's like what day is that again? Fall into the wayside. But anyway, please come to our live show. It's definitely a nice way to spend a, a Friday, I suppose. Yeah, and, it'll uh, be really fun. We're gonna yeah. I'm gonna be boozing it up with you. Cannot wait. There's gonna be like an Q and A Q&A in intermission. Yeah. Um And uh, can I make one teeny announcement? Oh yeah. Okay, uh, I'm just very excited because as a lot of you apparently don't know, I host a podcast with my brother um, called Beach to Sandy Water to Wet, but he also started his own show called Human Seeking Human where he reads like personal ads from yeah. old, old newspapers, and he had me on as his first ever guest, and it was super fun, and he found literal photos and articles of me from newspapers from like 2005 in Cincinnati. Holy shit that I didn't know existed from like me in the school play, all these like just horribly embarrassing outfits. Aww. And uh, he just sprung it all on me. And then he made me tell my worst dating story ever. So if you want to hear that, you can listen to Human Seeking Human. It's a, It was a fun time and also really kind of uh, brought up a lot of terrible memories. So thanks, Andy. Yay, thanks for the trauma. Um, <laughs> what were well, your, I'm not going to ask what your favorite uh, or what your, worst dating story was obviously because they should go listen to that episode but Spoilers. was it blaze was it blaze tell me it was, it was blaze. not oh it was, it was not blaze it was Damn just it. a rough time i tell you what you would have heard about it if it was blaze but 
It was the time when I thought that person had a dog. Let's just leave it at that. Oh, and they didn't. <laughs> is this you've told me this story? Yes, I think so. I don't I, like to talk about it, but I tell it pretty often for someone who doesn't like to talk about it. So I do remember the story. Yep. Uh, I it's, understand uh, why you don't want to share it. <laughs> I was like really mortified. I was like, why am I saying this on a microphone? Also, just it's, heads up. My sister just texted me the words. Blood can be used as a substitute for eggs in most recipes. Nothing further. You know what? So. It's shocking that like. It took three kids to find a mini Renata <laughs> through the child. Yeah. Like, she had to have three of you to find someone who was just her clone. In it's the, disturbing in the a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, speaking of siblings. So, Em, do you have any news? Why do you drink? Uh, unfortunately, no. I'm a very unnoteworthy person. Oh, I do have, I guess, something that... Uh, so I'm starting London Fog Fridays because... Oh, yes! You have started a freaking cult, man. I really have. And especially like in the times where I'm talking about a cult as my topic. It's very interesting. Yeah, I bought one and I'm a coffee drinker and I went and bought one and was like, what am I doing? So I also, first of all, thank you. I, I appreciate the love, even though I, I reap no reward other than They're my great, pride. though. Yeah, you were right. For those of you who are wondering, I have seen a few people say that they tried it and they just didn't like it. And I want to be very clear. And let me make this my London Fog PSA, my LF PSA, if you will. Um, if you are getting a London Fog, a lot of people have been saying, how do I order it so I know that I'm getting your experience? Mm. And it's uh, <clears throat> for some reason, the hot ones are always basically made right. Um, the cold ones, like a lot of employees and when i say a lot of employees i personally am talking about starbucks because that's where i order mine from they like fucking forget like their brains break when you ask for an iced one <laughs> like every time i order one they like look a little shocked because i think they're trying to figure out how to make it the fastest because with an ice london fog you have to basically let the tea steep for like 10 minutes before you can put ice on it and so oh god you are that customer huh well i tell them and if, so to to let you know how i order it I do tell them in advance, like, hi, I'd like an Iceland and Fog. And I then say, I know it takes a while. I don't mind waiting. Okay. Just because I think a lot of the reason why they look so shocked is because they have, they feel like they probably have to relay to me that it's going to take forever for that drink to be made, right? But so if you say, like, I know it takes, I think, eight minutes to steep, say that and also make sure that they are putting vanilla in it because one of the reasons it can taste like trash is because they're making it the shortcut way which is they're not steeping any brand new tea they're just using iced tea and throwing milk in it which is not the mm. same thing that's like their if you get a london fog if you ask for an ice london fog and it takes a minute and you have a you have a cup in your hand they made it the shortcut way and it's not the right way and make sure that it does have vanilla in it so I'm just saying that now because I've been asked by, I swear, like 300 people exactly how I order it. So there you go. And a lot of people say, not a lot, but I've seen quite a few say they're allergic to lavender or they don't like lavender. And that mm -hmm. is that in Earl Grey or what is that? I think it's the, I don't know enough about Earl Grey, but I, or I don't know enough about tea in general, but Earl Grey has the lavender yes. tea leaves in it. So Right. Yeah. So that could be an issue if you're not a fan of that. Just I would recommend up. that an English breakfast maybe. Uh, as a as a second situation sure I, sure okay i but, love a darjeeling but we could get into this on another podcast anyway so uh london fog fridays because so many people have been posting pictures and basically my entire instagram feed has been me reposting everyone's london fog experiences we're doing <laughs> london fog fridays now where uh if you basically i'm going to be every thursday which actually is starting today um, oh yeah wait a second <laughs> every thursday i am going to be posting on close friends which means you do have to join patreon for this um to be able to see my close friends i'm gonna be posting a secret word or a code word or whatever and if you take a picture of you with your london fog uh and tag me in it on a friday this is, we're only doing this on fridays if you tag me in a picture of you with your london fog and you use that secret word as the hashtag you're gonna be in a running for me to personally Venmo you $5 so you get your next London Fog on me. Um, Such a cute idea. I love and, it. And thank you. And also, if you happen to not go to like a Starbucks or somewhere else, if you go to a Black-owned shop, um, also write the restaurant in your tag so I can look it up and make sure it is a Black-owned place. And uh, I, you'll be in the running 10 times instead of just one. <gasps> love this. This is so fun. So wait, sorry. So you post the code word on Thursday. I'm going to post it. 
That way you have all, you see it all Friday long or. Got you. Know. you. Okay. And then Friday you have the time to post your. Yeah. So a, but... a lot of people have been uh, tagging me in pictures before I even wake up on Friday. So if I post it on Thursday, at least everyone's starting Friday God. sees this code. Right. And we wake up late. So. <laughs> so fair. if you take a picture of yourself with like today I have coffee beans. Sorry. But click, click, <gasps> click. I know. But if you take a picture of yourself with That's your tea. also not a London fog. What's happening? Because Coffee Bean doesn't offer London Fogs on their Postmates menu. So oh, that's it's just black tea. But if you take a picture of yourself, one, with your tea, two, tag me in it, three, use the hashtag that I post on Close Friends. And if it's a black owned restaurant or a black owned coffee shop, also write that down so I can double check it's a black owned space and you'll be in the running for not only a five dollar Venmo from me, but I think we're also going to do a shout out for you in the newsletter. So <gasps> fun! Um, if you would like to be a part of that, London Fog Fridays are a go, and then that way all of the London Fog pictures I post on Instagram won't just be a hundred percent of my feed all week long. <laughs> Love that. So, are you reposting those posts though, uh, or just to your close friends? I'll repost them to my close friends. Okay, makes sense. So yeah. people don't cheat and steal the code word. Exactly. Got exactly. you. Okay. Cool. Well, I'm excited. I uh, bought one yesterday, so I missed the cutoff. But maybe I'll I'll save the photo. Okay. Uh-huh. Now I'm just giving people uh-huh. ways to cheat. Uh, never mind. It's just my way to cheat. You can't take. Now cheat. you have to also take a picture of like like a calendar a or like. <laughs> A calendar doesn't work because you can say, look what The calendar on your phone. I got to know where the dot is, you know? (laughs) Oh, my God. Anyway, this has been very long-winded. And you asked why I drink. And it's because I'm happy to announce London Fog Friday. Amazing. I'm excited to enter and uh, not win because I don't – that's not how this works. But I'm excited to have an excuse to drink more London Fogs. Perfect. Um, But, yeah, that's all I've got. You're a poopy head. Uh, I was on Human (laughs) Seeking Human. We're doing – well, Em's doing London Fog Fridays, and we have a live show. Oh, and I pronounced Beaujolais wrong, which people are, like, not happy about, and I apologize. I I looked at it after after we recorded, and I went, oh, yeah, I completely butchered that. It's Beaujolais, not Beaujolais. Okay, oh. I'm sorry, but I was drinking it when I was like 19. Sorry, mom and dad. So it like, sounds like bougie. Like I get it. it yeah, sounds, yeah. And I know it made me sound like an uncultured swine, and I apologize. <laughs> um, but that's the one what who I am. drinks wine out of a box. Uncultured? I know. I'm like, what did what? you expect from me? Uh, <laughs> French is also not my for any language. Third, fourth, fifth, first. Let's let's. Uh, I'm just putting it out into the world that like, since you like box wine specifically, Trader Joe's, maybe they should make one called Trader Jojolay. <laughs> I'm just Hang saying. On, that's great. Oh, speaking of which, look what I brought. Since it's uh, five my, my time now. Look Cheers. at you. It's a. Uh, it's actually white today, but it's um probably not very cold anymore. But that's okay. Cheers. Cheers to you, Christine. Mm. Let's talk about your boobs. I'm happy to talk about my boobs. Uh, my third love bras, <laughs> which are the only thing that I wear, especially nowadays. And uh, I saw a couple of people on Twitter ordering them, and I was so proud. I was like, now we're bra twins. And I think they <laughs> unfollowed me after that. Anyway. You're, you're bosom buddies, some bosom might say. Buddies. Hold on. <laughs> you're welcome, third love. You've heard us talk about their Fit Finder quiz, which we love. And they also just launched the Fitting Room, which is a new and improved version of the quiz we all know and love, which I'm very excited to be able to take a new quiz now. And it focuses on size, <laughs> brush shape, current fit issues, and your personal style to deliver bras and underwear that are perfect for you and only you. You can also meet their newest collection, the Ombre Mesh, a collection worth obsessing over. Uh, it's a throwback look, modern feel, silky layered mesh that gets the vintage treatment in their timeless new collection. Can't confirm. Em knows all about it. It looks swanky. It, <laughs> it looks does swanky. Look swanky. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now they're offering our listeners 20% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash drink now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 20% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash drink for 20% off today. Warby Parker is committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores, offering eyeglasses, sunglasses, eye exams, and contact lenses. Glasses start at only $95, which includes prescription lenses. I have many of them. Sunglasses, progressives, and blue light lenses are also available. Also have those. Um, I've taken advantage of the great price point and the great quality, and I can confirm that it's worth it. Our favorite thing also is that you can take a quiz. Uh, You do their home try-on kit. You get a 
different glasses sent to your house. You can try them on for yourself. Christine did it. She sent <laughs> pictures out to the world and everyone got to pick with her which Warby Parker glasses she was going to select. I remember you picking the ones that made you look like Jeffrey Dahmer, which That's is right. Spoiler alert. I've picked, I picked multiple of them. So I won. <laughs> uh, I won in that game. <laughs> try Warby Parker's free home try on program. Order five pairs of glasses to try at home for free for five days. There's no obligation to buy. Ships free and includes a prepaid return shipping label. Try five pairs of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash drink. Mm -hmm. Uh, We do have a lot to cover today. Yeah, let's go. I am warning everybody. A lot of you like to listen from most recent and you're working your way down if you're new. So I'm telling you right now, it is going to be impossible to listen to this episode. And don't take that as a challenge without (laughs) listening to the previous episode. um, Because this is a part two. And a lot of things I'm going to say are not going to make sense, especially because this is a conspiracy theory. Uh, So if I just dive into lizard people, you're not going to know what the fuck I'm talking about. So um, also, I want to say thank you to everybody who has been sending me really nice comments about I just, I worked really, really hard on these notes, like a lot harder than I'm going to admit to. Um, <clears throat> but I worked really hard because this isn't just a conspiracy theory, which I would usually cover like, you know, Project Pegasus and like time travel is fun. This is a a conspiracy theory that people are dealing with right mm-hmm. now. And it's a sure. really big situation and it's become, it's radicalizing people at like wild rates and it's super political or it's not political, but it's it's inserted itself into politics. And so um, I appreciate everyone being really nice. And I feel for all the people who are suffering right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because I have tried to put so much information into this, unfortunately, for those who don't like this topic, this actually has to now become a three-parter. <gasps> so... Um, No, you guys, you can't not like it because this is one of my favorite topics you've ever covered. It's so creepy and fun. It's true crime and conspiracy. It's not fun. I mean, you know, it's funny. I know. I got you. It is. It's interesting. And that's that's also the fine line that I feel like we have to ride too because it is really fun. It's like you're totally right in that it's like fun and bananas and like, holy shit, I can't believe people think about this stuff. But at the same time, the it's really topical and like it's. Uh, a like lot it's of people's pe- reality. I mean, it's like when we talk about like Jonestown or something. That's crazy now, but like, can you imagine back then when people because had it's family so removed, members in right. it or like people right. who knew people who died? You know. It's, so yeah, you're right. It's like when it's so timely and people are who are listening could be like, oh shit, my brother or whomever. Yeah. yeah. It's and also uh, to remember that even though like it's it's funny in one way because we're talking about things that to people who aren't invested in this, mm-hmm. it is so outlandish and wild but this is just you know it's a really good reminder of how easy it is to fall into things Uh, and like and all the people that we're talking about even though you may want to think of them as terrible people who think all the most extreme things at the beginning of it at least in terms of QAnon uh, they are victims of brainwashing so let's remember that Um, yeah Just in case someone is, you know, with their friends and, like, going to joke about this right now while they're listening. Just remember there are people who are, like, truly suffering right now. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, here's... Light a candle. It's called Nordic Cabin. Oh, perfect. It's nature cozy. Nature cozy. Settle in. Settle in. And also, uh, I'm... A lot of the things I said I would address in this episode, I now have to address in the next episode because... This is the weird middle part where I'm explaining a lot of, it's a lot. So buckle up. (laughs) Okay, I'm ready. Also, I usually, I know we like to credit ourselves in that we are usually very um, down the the middle. And Mm -hmm. like, you know, we don't really make our personal claims super known in terms of like where we stand on a story. Yeah, we try to do fair reporting. Yeah. Yeah. Today, I'm not going to do that. I am coming to a... I'm just announcing my personal opinion entirely. This is a fucking cult. Like just yeah. after after everything that I've read. Yeah. And especially because this is the the group that tells you to quote do your own research. Okay, I did my own <laughs> research and this is a fucking cult. So, um and if you think that it's not not to sound like I'm from I'm in part of QAnon, but do your own research because it is absolutely right. a cult. Yeah, we welcome you <laughs> to do that. <laughs> and one of the things that I'm going to be talking about today are 
uh, I'm at least going to be talking about some of the ways. I'm going to really focus on that in the next episode. I have a whole section called ways that this is a cult. Um, (laughs) So look out for that next week. But this is all the stuff kind of leading up to it. Okay, great. I'm so excited to just hear the rest. So for those of you who are not listening to me and are listening to this episode first, um, before last week's episode, uh, I'm just going to remind people of some of the crazier beliefs out there. And I'm doing that mainly to let you see how how extreme it gets. Um, okay. Because as a conspiracy theory, which I would identify as a cult, um, I don't identify as a cult, as I would define as a cult. <laughs> oh, my God. Wait a uh, second. Hang on. Fog Fridays are becoming kind of troubling, in my opinion. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's to let you know that, like, it starts out really, really innocent. It starts out really gradual, and it just fucking skyrockets. That's so dangerous, though. Yeah, like you said. So here are some of the beliefs. Uh, I'm going to repeat what I said last week, um, and I'm also going to add on a few things that I found in this week's research. So the I just copy and pasted this from last week's uh, notes. The core belief at, I'm, I'm not talking about the super wild stuff. You can hear about that in last week's episode. The core belief, though, uh, when you really hit like peak QAnon is that Hollywood is stealing children, especially newborns or babies, and uh, keeping them in underground caves. Elites, such as Democrats and Hollywood celebrities, are uh, hosting occult sacrifices. And uh, with these babies, they are either possessed, they're holding these sacrifices for babies so that they can eat these babies. And then these Hollywood elites and Democrats unbeknownst to us, are actually either interdimensional demons or reptilian lizard people. And during this ritual, they shed their skin and drink the blood of these babies because the younger you are, the more adrenochromes you have in your blood, which is a chemical that apparently is either a psychedelic or works as a fountain of youth, or some say that it helps you gain power above trump and all these people and therefore they're controlling the mass media their mass media is part of it because hollywood is in on this and they're covering it up um also there's a term in that the storm where eventually the storm is coming and the storm is that everyone's going to find out about all of these celebrities they're going to be imprisoned executed on guantanamo bay um And after the storm will be the great awakening where after all the bad people are gone and we realize QAnon was right all along, we will enter a utopia where we have saved all of the babies from human trafficking. That's just the basics, guys. Don't worry. That's just, just, I know that seems really vague, but. (laughs) The one person who decided to like listen to this first is like, oh, fuck. Now they like, they're checking. Ah, See, (laughs) Em tried to warn you and you didn't listen. (laughs) So uh, everything after that, which there's a fucking lot. (laughs) Um, everything after that, all the way down to, like, the government made Monsters, Inc. because they felt guilty or wanted to, like, leak this information. That was one of my yeah. Everything that else you hear in QAnon falls into just different factions, but the root of all of this stays with this Hollywood demon ring. Some of the other things that I learned in this week's research are that Obama's the Antichrist, uh, the Pope is a hologram, the moon is hollow, <gasps> of course. Uh, you should stop paying your debt. So this is where it gets a little culty. Oh, you should stop okay. paying off your debt. I did, I'll do that. Because Fine apparently up. one of the beliefs is that there's like there was this financial program that from the 90s that was like defunct, but they think it's coming back and they're going to pay off all your debts, which one of the things about cults is that they start taking your money. And uh-huh. even if you're not paying your money to anybody, they are giving you financial struggles. What else? Uh, oh, yeah. The government is going to steal your children and your neighbors might be in on it. Oh, um, and Trump, if he would have won, would have actually only been the 19th president instead of like 40. one 2020. Like if he won in 2021. Or, yeah, if he won 2020, sorry, he would actually, like, how he's known as 45, 45th yeah. president, he actually would have just been the 19th president because, uh, uh, we'll get into it. Also, one ex-QAnon member said, in a quote to Anderson Cooper, that one of his beliefs was that 
Q is a group of fifth dimensional, intradimensional, extraterrestrial, bipedal bird aliens called the Blue Avians. So, Wait, like, that's the Q group. Like, that's the, one of the beliefs of who Q is. They thought that these were oh, like these, the Q, the person or the, the no, person. Sorry, not Q. person. That's the wrong word. Uh, the <laughs> be, the being. Uh huh. I guess uh-huh. the bird. Okay. So they think that one of the options, because one of the things I said I would cover in this week's episode is who is Q. Ah, yes, that's right. To remind everybody, Q is the anonymous poster who has been on 4chan and then 8chan. And then it has been leaving all these, quote, clues for people to decode. And that's how they're coming to realize all these things. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of conversation about who Q is. We still don't know. Apparently, some extremists think that they are interdimensional blue aliens or something. Oh, my. But anyway, let's really get down to one of the probably most important things that I absolutely did not discuss last week because I just really needed the time to do more research is that in the core belief that there is this Hollywood Democrat elite Mm. group of people trafficking children and drinking their blood, if you have any at all background with uh, anti-Semitic tropes, the core value, this core value of QAnon just fucking screams Mm anti-Semitism. I'm going to say now, not all of QAnon is anti-Semitic, but a lot of factions and the fact that the core belief of QAnon is anti-Semitic. I think it's not 100% anti-Semitic, but a lot of people in there Mm. would really like to push that narrative. Because a lot of people remember QAnon is this huge conspiracy theory where anyone can fall in. So, like, you're not inherently anti-Semitic when you join QAnon. Right. And a lot of people just don't know the historical roots, which I'm about to explain. But a lot of people don't know that that's even an anti-Semitic trope. So when they fall in, they have no idea they're being fed this anti-Semitic right. narrative. So and then it's still part of it. Yeah. They're still part of it and yeah. have no idea, at least in the beginning, then again, there are people who are falling into this who already know that trope and agree with it in some right. way and they're running with it. So there's a lot of different levels of people in here who actually agree with that shit. But over time, the more extreme you become, the more sinister that thought process gets mm. in. And it's another wonderful way for white nationalists to become your friends. So love that. So let's talk about it because I don't think enough people know And I also think that this, because a lot of people don't know, this might actually be a really good way to maybe rattle Mm. some of the people who are lost in QAnon right now. If you teach them the anti-Semitic history of some of the core values, they might realize, holy shit, this is like, I don't, hopefully, who knows, but it might be the thing that rattles someone. So, um, so since the 12th century, there's this really horrific thing called uh, blood libel accusations. Mm. Basically, it's that Jewish people ritualistically murder Christian children. And and, and for some reason, uh, the intention is to gather or harvest those children's blood. Um, which sounds fresh out of QAnon. Um, yeah. Interesting parallel, yeah. <laughs> it's it's ve- Once you know that, it becomes so clear where yeah. th- this was inspired by. Totally. And some might say that means that the person who is Q and starting off all of these paranoid beliefs is probably a white nationalist. Some sure. people. That's an easy but it one also to believe. A, but also a bird, right? But also a bird. Like, just okay. like, like if Hitler and a bird had a Jesus, baby. Jesus, it's a racist bird baby. <laughs> God. No, don't follow the racist bird baby. So apparently uh, the the belief that uh, that jews are drinking christian's blood comes originally from this book called or a pamphlet i guess called the protocols of the elders of zion Mm. um and this was in 1903 it's a fake pamphlet by the fucking way like the text is not it's fiction Mm. and it's pretty much just a massive book just listing all the most anti-semitic things you could think about a person one of the big things being blood libel Um, And this wasn't just a one-time thing. This has been following Jewish people for almost literally a thousand years. There have been many times in history where Jewish people were tortured. It was kind of like the the witch trials where even if you weren't a witch, you would just get tortured until you admitted guilt. Yeah, you can't win that. Right, right. Yeah. So it only bolstered this opinion that like, oh, see, Jewish people are admitting (sighs) to this. And it's like, well... Oh, no, this sure, is not what's happening. Yeah, that's... Through this, it's just, you know, through telephone 
things warp and spiral. And so there has also been other blood libel beliefs that like Jewish people don't drink wine. They actually drink blood. Okay. Um, or that on like Jewish, uh, certain Jewish holidays, they'll mix children's blood into their pastries. Like it My gets God. really fucking weird. If you happen to be someone who's new to QAnon or if you know someone who's new to QAnon and looking into it, if you look up powerful elites killing babies and drinking blood, the thousand year old anti-Semitic narrative will surface real quick. If you just mm. Google it, you don't even have to put Jews in there or you don't have to put, you know, uh, any anything that's directly anti-Semitic. If you just write that kind of basic concept into Google, you're going to start being really fed a very specific belief system. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so most anti-Semitic tropes that are inspired or that have been inspired through QAnon all kind of come from the protocols that pamphlet, whether right. or not you realize it. Um, and here are just some of the other things that are maybe a more modern version of that. So one of the big beliefs is that uh, George Soros and the Rothschilds are in control of the world. If you don't know, they're very wealthy Jewish people. A lot of people say that they own most of the world's wealth or they're part of the Illuminati or something like that. Um, and they often get really involved or their their character gets involved in a lot of these cults because a lot of uh, angry white nationalists and a lot of angry anti-Semitic people uh, like to throw their name into the mix mm. when they're angry about like an easy target. Exactly. Yeah. Um, to a point where there have been a few social media marketing companies who have been keeping tabs on like posts about them. And pretty much every single one has at least one death threat in the comments. Like, oh my God. there's just a, a lot of people have a lot to say about Jewish people and Jewish families who aren't doing anything. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, like, give it a rest. Like, give us a goddamn break. Um, <sighs> also, QAnon mentions a lot the elders of Zion or a Zionist government. Um, that also comes from the protocols. Basically, I, I kind of hinted at it earlier, but it comes from Jews almost controlling the world or controlling the media. Like, if you were to type in the media or whatever is eating babies, it it, it stems from... Jews drink children's blood. Mm -hmm. It comes from Jewish people often being Democrats. It also is probably has been really reinforced in this last t election. Sorry, an, al an alien's coming by. <laughs> an ambulance coming Xenon! by. Xenon! Oh my god, Xenon! Not she got, to a, be new, she got not a new be horn. Not to be confused with Zion. Let's oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's very different. The Zionists. Uh, but yeah, so the idea that uh, there's a Zionist government comes from the protocols and it's that it's this conspiracy theory that uh, Jews control Western state governments. And that comes from Jewish people often being Democrats. And uh, again, like I just said, is probably heavily reinforced in this last election, but because Hollywood has a lot of Jewish people and because Hollywood is mainly democratic and because Jews are mainly democratic. And that means that all three of them combined, if you're, in Hollywood, a Democrat and or Jewish. I'm apparently a triple threat. Um, they... Geo's like, oh my God. <laughs> Whoa, you said the magic words. <laughs> apparently, uh, they, they're they the ones in charge of running the child ring. I also wrote these notes super late last night. So if I'm repeating myself a lot, I'm sorry. I just wanted to really get the point across that like, if you are in charge of Hollywood, you're basically in charge of the media. And so now when people say, the media has a human sex trafficking ring. That trope is so associated with Jews at this point that you don't have to say the media. People already know, especially right. those who follow the protocols. Yeah. They know that when you say the media or Democrats or Hollywood, you mean Jews. And when you say it's anything like a about babies. Now. Yeah. Yeah. So it, you only have to know really like basic context to be able to read between the lines very clearly. Totally. And uh, then there's another thing in the protocols called the Great Replacement, which is just a terrible white nationalist conspiracy theory that my people are apparently leading immigrants of color into the United States purely so that we can wipe out white people. Um, For God's sake. And white nationalists will say that this is, quote, the biggest genocide in human history. Oh, for God's sake. Okay. <laughs> uh-huh. Christ. Uh, and this is not the first time we've heard anything like this from white nationalists, but... Apparently the the theory is alive and well. God. You also heard it at the um, I remember because I was 
you know, Charlottesville isn't too far from my hometown. And during the Charlottesville protests mm-hmm. a few years ago, a lot of the neo-Nazis there were saying Jews will not replace us. And that was in reference to probably them following the protocols and being afraid of the great replacement. I mean, so, it's just horrifying. I mean, obviously, but it's it like all, that classic it just doesn't fear get, mongering. It doesn't change. Like, this has been the same, like you said, for thousands of years. It's just going to keep cycling. It's horrible. It, it only gets worse. Uh, and like, and a lot of people were wondering why I didn't talk about this at all last week. And I hope you can see now, like, there's just a lot that I wanted to cover and there was just no way I was going to get through it quickly. But so another belief that QAnon has regurgitated out of these protocols is that global conspiracy, global conspiracies in general are something that QAnon really loves to push. And at this point, after so many centuries, globalists has just kind of become a sneaky way of saying Jewish people, um, oh at least in conversations like this. So when you hear QAnon saying there's a global conspiracy, uh-huh. no matter how new they are or unaware they are of anti-Semitic tropes, they are now pushing to what some people will hear as Jewish people. I see. Okay. Um, so uh, other global conspiracies are that the Jews had some responsibility with 9-11. Like, it's, it's all Great. stupid. Um, and so many people in QAnon are obviously alt-right, and that means that they probably know a few white nationalists if they don't identify as that themselves. Um, And even if you don't identify as it, you probably say some pretty white nationalist shit. Um, And so they, like I said earlier, some people don't really understand this stuff yet, but some people really know about it and they are for pushing this narrative in a sneaky way where people don't even really know what they're saying until it's too fucking late because it has seeped within their psyche over time. And now they believe these things and it's too late to tell them like, hey, that was pretty anti-Semitic of you to think Mm -hmm. these things. So that still makes things super dangerous for people, especially white nationalists, because now instead of saying directly, hey, I think Jewish people are eating our babies, (laughs) you can say, hey, I think that there's a human trafficking ring in Hollywood. And God, yeah, it's a global conspiracy. And it's like so loaded and you don't even realize. And because you can be so because it's such a passive way of being anti-Semitic, you almost get validated and this new permission to spread that information without getting harassed for your opinion. So it's just extra sinister because now it's almost like people with these genuine beliefs are able to recruit people without anyone noticing. Wow. Um, And so QAnon definitely, uh, white nationalists have been spreading this hatred to newcomers for a while now. Um, Actually, I would say QAnon became mainstream in 2018, um, Mm -hmm. halfway between Pizzagate and this election. Um, I guess there was a few midterm elections in 2018 where people started really repping QAnon at at rallies. And Mm -hmm. so that was when it really took off. And I'm not saying that that's the reason for it, that there were all of a sudden these people reading into anti-Semitic tropes, whether or not they were aware of that. But in 2018, um, there was a 12% increase in anti-Semitic incidents. Um, in 2019, there were, uh, it hit a f- four decade high, uh, according to the anti-defamation league of anti-Semitic shit going on in the country. Yeah. Um, in 2020, uh, the Capitol, which for many LOL. reasons, yeah, yeah. I, I was just going to say it half haphaz- haphazardly, half hazardly. And then I was like, <laughs> I, I can't even get through that sentence. But for a, there's a lot of reasons why a lot of people were angry or had their own view of what storming the Capitol meant. But uh, a lot of it had its hand in anti-Semitic ideology because a lot of QAnon people were there. A lot of white nationalists were there. Even if you're one but not the other, you all kind of have the same core beliefs. And you might think that you don't like Jewish people. This one might think that Hollywood is lizard people, but they both come from the same history and you mm. can bond in that. And it was just a bunch of angry people who think that they're right, um, especially because a lot of white nationalists uh, have read this book called The Turner Diaries, which is more or less, some say their Bible, the white nationalist Bible. Oh, great. And it's about a violent overthrow of the government, which is... So a lot of, let's, let's put it this way, a lot of people who stormed the Capitol that day, their, quote, Bible is a violent overthrow of the government. The book ends with mass lynchings, fire in the streets of D.C., and, quote, 
this isn't a direct quote, but a paraphrase that every Jew's throat is cut by the end. Cool. And that's victory for them. Cool. What a cool paraphrase. Thank you for sharing. (laughs) You're welcome. People who were there who apparently see this as a crucial text were hanging out with other people who are being fed this kind of information in a really insidious way. Yeah. And... Also, we saw a lot of people there who were just beyond anti-Semitic. There was apparel, there were signs, there were symbols, there were people Mm. there wearing Camp Auschwitz shirts. Jesus, Um, I didn't even see that. Yeah, and and the motto underneath it was the English version of the, I don't know how to say it in German, but it's the thing that's on the the thing uh, in Auschwitz. Yeah, 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 yeah. The work. uh, Work brings freedom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that was the, the... It's written in German at actual Auschwitz over the gates. Yeah, um, yeah. But the Ugh, English it version makes me like sick to my stomach. English. The English version was written under the Camp Auschwitz phrase. Cute, great. Um, That's hilarious. Who lets them make these T-shirts? I mean, Jesus. Someone like... and well, really, the answer to that, and at least terms of QAnon, not not white nationalists. Although I would imagine the answer is the same. Is that there are surprisingly so many people somehow in this movement that everyone's got a trade, everyone's got a skill, and yeah, someone's true. skill is making right. sure it's like its own environment. Yeah. Anyway, so those people were floating around the Capitol that day, and they're also floating around QAnon, pushing this narrative that Democrats and in Hollywood are running this human sex trafficking ring. And anyone that knows basic knowledge of anti-Semitic tropes knows that if you say Democrats, globalists, whatever, you basically Mm. mean Jewish people. And then white nationalists who already knew about the protocols or know about the Turner diaries are hearing this information and not disagreeing and maybe even recruiting their own friends into this group where they're understood. And so I do want to say really quickly there I got a lot of this information from some really wonderful websites. I am going to link a few of them. I'm going to have Eva put them in the show notes just so people know where I got this information because it was really well done. Um, One of my favorites was uh, this blog called Religion in Public by a guy named Paul. I think it's Juppe, which is funny because it sounds a little like Jew. (laughs) But uh, Paul D-J-U-P-E. Juppe, right? I have no clue. Well, anyway, he made an incredible uh, several posts on his blog called Religion in Public, and uh, they were charts. There was a bunch of charts of correlations right now. It's I would argue these are some like the first real studies we're seeing about QAnon and how they're affecting people's mindsets. Oh, wow. In terms of anti-Semitism, because they were charts that had to do with anti-Semitic tropes, being a nationalist or having nationalist views and your interaction with QAnon and seeing how all of those work based on every anti-Semitic trope one by one. Jeez. So it was really super interesting. There was another one he did where it just uh, had uh, the comparisons and charts involving nationalists and QAnon. It's really interesting. So um, I'm going to have Eva put those in the show notes. Uh, please go look at them. It's super, super uh, interesting. So anyway, that's my little anti-Semitic portion which I never thought I'd say that sentence, Fun. but <laughs> welcome um, to our show. Anyway, oh. it's it's a, a really good lesson in that even if you fall into QAnon because you're really into time travel or you're really into just wanting to save people from being human trafficked or you're into the new age movement, whatever it is, these tropes already exist. And whether or not you know the history, mm-hmm. they're going to slowly be enforced on you. And by the time you realize it, it might be too late. That's the whole point of this. And as a topic that uh, is more or less about people who are being brainwashed right now, this is some of the information that they might not even really realize is happening to them because it's seeping in so gradually. Mm -hmm. So um, I just want people to know where some of the roots of this come from or the type of people who are recruiting loved ones. Yeah. I did say last time I was going to talk about who is Q. So uh, I don't want to leave people hanging on that because there's a lot of theories. Um, Basically, Q followers see... (laughs) This is kind of the the best irony of all. By the way, we're not talking about anti-Semitism anymore. So, like, we can all take a big breath and, like, you know, leave that space and be a little more jovial, even though this is still a really sad topic. But we can at least leave the... Leave the Jewish people alone for a second. Thank God. Let them take Um, a breather. They deserve it. I'll take a breath for all my fellow Jewish folks. (laughs) 
Ooh, oh my gosh. Um, I'm going to put my wine down and have some water. I feel like I need to rehydrate. I just that. rehydrated too. I, that yeah. was really, it was really exhausting to cover that because I was like, I don't want to offend anyone, but also people need to know about mm-hmm. this shit. So it's definitely a, a different reporting than ghosts and aliens. Slightly, um, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I'm used to getting to be lighthearted with my stuff and wanted to make sure that I wasn't upsetting anyone more than they no, already deserve to be so who is QAnon? the 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 biggest irony of them all to me is that QAnon is this whole group that tells you don't trust unsource or uh, unreliable <laughs> right. sources don't trust unreliable sources and yet q is an unreliable source and th- that's where they're getting all these like fucking codes from and all these little messages from so for them to see the uh, the secrecy of Q and not knowing who he is and this mystere, and they consider that the ultra credibility is just beyond to me, and it lets you kind of get a quick glimpse into how warped this thinking yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, like how it just doesn't even track. It doesn't even click. You could go up to someone and be like, "Oh, I don't trust sources. I can't. I don't know. Like, I don't know exactly well." Oh, okay. Well, then who's Q? Well, I don't know. Okay. Well, then why are yeah, you fucking listening to him? Track. Yeah. So there are big names uh, that people think could be Q, although big names in QAnon, like famous YouTubers and all these people who are profiting off of the QAnon movement, they say that they have opinions on who they think Q is, but they won't even hint who they think it is because they think Hollywood would find out and they would get killed. Like Q okay. would get killed and compromised or whatever. So Wouldn't want that, yeah. Wouldn't want that. <sighs> So 4chan, which I've talked about before. My favorite trusted source. That's the only source, actually. (laughs) I don't trust anything you're saying because I get all my news from 4chan. There's nothing I love more than trusting only 4chan. Oh, and E-bombs world also. Oh, right, right, right. And addictinggames.com, but that's it. Okay, but addictinggames.com actually had some fun stuff on there. Slime volleyball, man. Oh, I was the I like the parking car one where you had to park into the parking lot. That was fun. We had fun games, kids. <laughs> we had parking games. Back okay. In my day, you to, could park a car online to play in the computer lab. All right. <laughs> so I don't know what else you want to hear. On my family computer, where I had to unplug the phone if I wanted a chance at dial up or a right, chance we had at the internet. Phones that plugged in. It's a whole thing. Anyway. <laughs> so okay, so four chan was a. Again, please go listen to the last episode. Also, please go listen to episode 175 because that's where I cover anonymous slash 4chan. And that will give you a lot of insight into this really quick thing I'm going to mention because I assume everyone's already heard me talk about it. 4chan was originally for pretty lonely people who... This was back in the day before there was a lot of internet and a, a lot of content out there. So on 4chan, people could go say whatever they wanted. And since being viral was kind of a brand new thing... Everyone wanted to be viral. Mm. And so since you were anonymously posting, you could get away with some really shocking shit with the intent of being the one that goes viral or the right. trying to grab attention before anyone else could. So one of the big genres on 4chan to grab people's attention were things like QAnon. So one of the things I find interesting is QAnon was never even a novel idea that there was this top secret anonymous person leaving codes for people or trying to help people wake up and see behind the scenes. Yeah. QAnon was actually a huge playing field. There was FBI Anon. There was HLI Anon, which is high level insider. There was CIA Anon. There was CIA intern. There was White House insider Anon. And so there, it was all more or wow. less the exact same thing where they would say, I have top secret clearance or I know something the world doesn't know, but I can't, you know, tell you who I am, but here are different clues right. for you to decode. Okay. And during this genre of 4chan, other people like knew it was a joke or if they didn't, they at least didn't take it that seriously. But pe- the goal was like to keep the thread moving. People would uh, boost it by leaving other comments like, oh no, wait, I'm I'm FBI Anon. Wait a minute, did you, I just see you in the break room? Or like, they would like oh, joke. Oh, got it. It was a joke. It was a game of like, like playing along or trying to make them stumble. Like, oh, if this is your proof, then how come this, this, and this? So it was very lighthearted compared to today. And if it was taken seriously, at least enough people weren't touching it, then nothing happened. Um, but for some reason, when QAnon showed up, people just fucking rode that wave compared to all the other times. 
no i don't know what was going on must have been something in the water just like hit the right nerve maybe or the yeah. right timing hit the right person who had a desire to right. spread it which is probably exactly what happened because there were three people two of them were 4chan moderators and one of them was a youtuber aha uh-huh. their names were paul ferber coleman rogers and tracy diaz who are now i think all very huge people in the QAnon world they're like QAnon oh, celebrities shit. All three of them basically took what Q was saying on 4chan and started spreading it on social media. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. So that gave it a platform, sort of. Gave it a... They, it spread amongst... It went farther than just a bunch of lonely people on 4chan who would ignore it eventually. Yeah. And so eventually this... Uh, the three of them kind of got really well known. One of them even went off and created this thing called Patriot Soapbox, where I think... I don't know which one it was, but... One of them created Patriot Soapbox, which has now become this, like, huge YouTube, I think, live streaming platform where, like, politicians have guested on this. Or, like, people in power are guesting on this as a Q, with a QAnon host or whatever. So that's, again, only furthering the the narrative. (laughs) Yeah. But anyway, so a lot of people think it could be Patreon soapbox or a Patriot soapbox. Some people think it could Patreon be soap. Patreon. It's their Patreon. It's our Patreon. If you spend two dollars a month, <laughs> <laughs> you can see Ted Cruz talk about his vacation. With some Q&A members. It's really, with, really fun. with all the lizards. <laughs> Worth it. So we talked about Best Fiends recently, Em, and mm-hmm. since then I have advanced nine levels. I'm now on eight eighty nine. So amazing. I'm. I'm cl- I passed a couple of people. I'm closing it, and I see some more up at about bleh, up at about a thousand. So I'm I'm catching up, folks. Be careful. Uh, Best fiends is basically what I do with all of my time. If I'm even if I'm watching TV, even if I'm like at the doctor's office, wherever I am, it's like such a nice, relaxing uh, game to play when you're on your phone and have you know nothing else going on. And the best part of Best Fiends is there's something new every day and tomorrow and the day after that. Literally thousands of levels to play and <laughs> counting. Plus tons of cute characters. You know, we love to uh, get attached to characters. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> my favorites. It's a whole thing. If you ever get tired of uh, solving puzzles, good news because with Best Fiends, the fun never ends. And you just don't blame us if you become slightly obsessed. You might. Uh, so welcome to the club. Download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Hello. Fresh. Wow, my echo sounds super weird today. I, uh, I'm in a cave. Help me. Help me. Help me. <laughs> I'm not going to help you, but I will lower you down my other portion of HelloFresh. And that means a lot because sometimes <laughs> I like to eat both. Um, as you all know, we love HelloFresh. I yesterday was really busy and I was like, Blaze, I need you to cook dinner. And he said, do you want me to like cook up some spaghetti? And I was like, oh, hell no. You are cooking me. Get this. The Louisiana style tilapia recipe. Okay. So oh he gosh. made me this beautiful fried fish with like coleslaw it was i was like blaze this is great and he's like you made me cook it and i was like i know but wasn't it fun (laughs) HelloFresh cuts out stressful meal planning and grocery store trips so you can enjoy cooking or get blaze to do it and get dinner on the table in about 30 minutes or less and HelloFresh offers over 23 recipes each week featuring a range of flavors cuisines and ingredients so you'll never get bored go to hellofresh.com slash drink 10 and use code drink 10 for 10 free meals including free shipping that's HelloFresh.com slash drink10 and use code drink10 for 10 free meals, including free shipping. Um, but so, yeah, some people think it was the original Q was Patriot Soapbox or one of the three people because since they already oh. were somehow invested in spreading it on social media, one of them must have cared enough to Interesting. be furthering it. And they're clearly still invested enough that like it's an yeah. important thing to them. Yeah, It gave them their careers, basically. Right, so, right. of course, if Q exists, they would want to be in on the breadcrumbs or whatever it is. Um, a lot of people actually also in QAnon either are really big fans of them or judge them because it sounds like if it was them, then they never really cared about Q at all. They just cared about uh, profiting and getting own. ads on YouTube. And they, a lot of times when they talk about QAnon, they'll like actually list their Patreon for donations and stuff. So it feels like they made this whole thing up just for profit. Right. Okay. So diehards will say, no, that's not the case. Other people have said like QAnon could exist. And if they're responsible, then they only really wanted it for the wrong reasons. Right. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so, the other big thoughts, uh, there's three main theories for who Q is. Basically, it's either a single individual, it is a collective, or it was an individual who became a collective. So if it was oh. if it was an individual, it could have been, some people literally fucking think it's Trump. Right. Um, He's some very, people think, very intelligent. Could pull that off, for sure. Uh, 
according to them, he is super smart and all of his tweets that are spelled wrong or something That's like right. that all actually are codes. You did teach me that last week. I forgot. So I'm too stupid. A person. lot of people think that Trump is one of, quote, the smartest men in the world because he plays dumb to the people who are sheeple and unaware of what's going on. But to the people who are awake, he's mm. giving them cues, cue, codes and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So either it's Trump, it's a White House or Trump admin person. Uh, some people think it's one of the original influencers, like I said. Some people think it's literally a random fucking kid in his basement who it just spiraled out of control one day because he was like, I just wanted to play the fucking game on 4chan. Everyone else was playing. Why you have an intern <laughs> got to play? Exactly. Oh, so God. imagine being that kid. Uh, Can you imagine be- and you're like Jewish or something? You're like, this is not what <laughs> oh I intended. Oh, my God. That, okay. Like- that's like the darkest funniest thing though you're like like, it was ironic it's like (laughs) i so didn't fucking mean for this to happen oh my god that's horrifying it's really horrifying (laughs) really horrifying i I really hope that's not the case because i don't know what i hope because like part of me is like well is it worse if it's a white nationalist like i I don't know it's all just fucking terrible it could be anyone from any spectrum especially under the belief that it was an individual and now it's a collective because then it almost removes the original responsibility from the first person and it really could have been just a random person online thinking they were playing a game and now all of a sudden he was like fuck this out of hand yeah yeah um people think it could literally be jfk jr because if you listen to my last (laughs) episode the last episode we talked about how jfk jr is alive according to some cute people dead according to some cute people um dead according to like everyone on dead according to everyone else um a lot of people which i will get into this one uh in a little bit but one of the things that some uh ex QAnon people have come out and said is that they think it could be a boomer baby boomer okay because some instead of them reading the weird breadcrumbs or reading the weird uh codes that q is leaking that Uh didn't make sense to the rest of the world but if you were trying to figure it out you'd you'd understand what he was saying a lot of people ran head first into it and said okay so these are codes that's why he's spelling things weird but other people who got out said i think this is a baby boomer who doesn't know how to fucking type online (laughs) oh my god can you imagine that realization you leave QAnon, and you're like oh my god it was just like someone's grandpa in florida the whole time like who doesn't know how to use a keyboard exactly so a lot of people have thought like this doesn't make sense he's like QAnon is telling us that he like I'm just going to say it now, but there's one guy who's really big in helping people. And he said that the thing that got him was QAnon was talking about like how he had just deactivated seven satellites. And this guy was like, you can deactivate seven satellites, but you can't fucking figure out like where the, the dots and the slashes go. Oh like, my like <laughs> Oh my God. And so that's another thing about it being kind of culty in my mind of like, the most obvious things that should break you yeah. don't work, but the smallest weird thing that everyone else knew all along is the thing that wakes people up. Yeah, so, interesting. <clears throat> so anyway, people think it could be any of those individuals. Um, a lot of people think it could also be JFK specifically because they have this belief that JFK is going to be found out to have been alive this whole time. Um, he, the only, a lot of people think that he was alive and he was leaving clues for us because apparently his gravesite is literally shaped like a Q. So people thought that like, oh my god, JFK Jr. was letting everyone know since the beginning before people were even paying attention to QAnon. They're like, I'm Q. <laughs> okay. Um, and so people also think Q could be a collective, which means it could be a bunch of 4chan people together. It could also, according to QAnon people, could be a a co-op of intelligence operatives all sharing access to this account to like all leak whatever they can when they find out about it. Um, some people think that it, it could be, uh, it was originally like a random 4chan person and then like intelligence operatives took over. I mean, it could be anything, wow. but uh, the biggest running theory I don't know how how much bigger it is than the rest, but one of the most understood theories is that it is actually a man and his son named Jim and Ron Watkins because they currently run the platform that Q writes on. Um, so, oh. so four so four chan was the original place that Q started, but then in 2018, four chan got too hostile and <laughs> you they don't liter- say i never <laughs> thought anyone would say those words 4chan got too <laughs> hostile it's like uh i thought that was 
understood from they day were one. too hostile in like 2006 like yeah you like from 2018? literally the first hour yeah oh my so God. apparently it got so bad that q actually got banned on 4chan wow and so uh q ended up moving to a different forum called 8chan and right. one day 8chan mysteriously also got deleted like not just q and on got banned from it but 8chan itself went the fuck away like the oh, website went wow. away okay and so Q ended up having to move again. And so uh, basically Q seemed to be hopping around the internet because what QAnon people thought or what QAnon followers believed is that he was getting found out and censored. And so Q had to keep infiltrating new spaces sure. to share this information. Really what happened for the people who are not in QAnon <laughs> Is that 4chan did take Reddit down because there were some really extreme 4chan boards going on. Um, and a lot of people who were interacting with Q on 4chan ended up trying to go somewhere else because they didn't like that they were being censored. If you remember from my anonymous episode, one thing a lot of 4chan anonymous people fucking hate is censorship. Right. Um, and so when they got banned from certain boards and saying what they wanted, they just stopped using 4chan altogether. So... There was this guy named Fred Brennan, and he created 8chan. He was definitely, like, I think a 4chan person on his own, and then he created 8chan because he thought that 4chan didn't allow enough control. Sure. So he created 8chan. When everyone got banned, all of a sudden he noticed that his page, 8chan, was all of a sudden getting all these people, and he was like, oh, shit, like, I never thought it would take off like this, but he had created it right after a bunch of anonymous people people had been censored and they needed a new place he literally he quote said i made the shitty decision to let all of the users stay because his he was his website was gaining traction and he never saw that coming he had basically created a community of people who agreed with him like i don't like being censored either so let's all hop on here and continue the q forum so it's another case of like oh i didn't mean for that to happen Basically, yeah. There was, I think, more intent because he was hoping for people to treat it like 4chan, but more, I don't know, I don't want to say he hoped for it to be more hostile, but he hoped for people to feel like they had more freedom to say whatever sure. they wanted. And amongst the, the 4chan community, that kind of means, like, I'm going to give you full permission to do whatever the fuck you want and let's see what happens. Yeah, okay. Um, And it really fucking went there. So, like, he, be careful what you wish for, I guess, because yeah. he... He wanted them to have the freedom to say what they wanted on his page, and they had the fucking freedom. Wow. Uh, and in a few cases, uh, remember I told you that one day, once Q moved from 4chan to 8chan, and then 8chan just mysteriously fucking went away one day. Yeah, yeah. So that Fred Brennan's company, 8chan, um, it vanished one day because apparently so many people were writing really wild extreme shit on there that they ended up finding at least three cases of really really brutal murders <gasps> what? and the people before they had either committed these murders or were imprisoned or whatever they had left like manifestos on <gasps> each chain. oh dear god okay and so it just goes to show you how wild human nature will take something <laughs> um right like the it'll just end up this the lowest denomination like it'll get yep. dragged to the lowest point so basically wow. fred was like Around the same time, he was already in talks with a guy, Jim Watkins, mm -hmm. who uh, already basically ran an 8chan or ran something similar to it in the Philippines. And Jim Watkins was like, let me take over 8chan for you. And after those three murders, it was specifically one murder in El Paso that really did him in, where he was like, fuck this. I don't want the responsibility anymore. I'm giving Jim Watkins 8chan. Oh, so he backed out. Like he, he backed out. Decided. He was like, oh, "This is okay. this is too fucking." It wasn't much. like the government was like, "This is too much." It was like he chose to shut it down or to leave. So, so okay, no, you're you didn't. I didn't say something correctly. So after that, uh, that El Paso shooting where they found a manifesto, <gasps> the host, the network host that was actually putting out H N. In, like stepped in and they were like fuck this like we're not oh, hosting okay. 8chan anymore okay. and they wiped it out at the same time fred was like i don't want the responsibility anyway so if it comes back on like that's jim watkins problem yeah like good for you bye okay got it got it got it that makes sense so so jim watkins ended up taking over 8chan turning it into i think like an extension of his own company which happened to be called like 8 kun 8 kun oh, 8 god. k u n what does that mean i don't want to know 
I don't want to know either. I, <laughs> I, I don't know. I since it's in the Philippines, I just assumed it was like a Tagalog word oh, for maybe. Chan or something. <laughs> I don't know. If I'm wildly ignorant and saying something that I shouldn't be saying, I'm please scared. let me know and I'll apologize. But it was um, eight K U N. So yeah, may, so you're right. Maybe it was just like a, a translation of eight Chan. Yeah, it's yeah. that's what it felt like to me um, as someone who's not involved in this stuff. But so anyway, after Fred stepped out. Jim Watkins and his son ended up taking it over and they had been following Q since before it was even on 8chan, I think. Um, and oh, they had, geez. and so the, th- one of the big running theories is that they're either Q themselves or they have friends who are willing to be um. Q on their behalf just so that, um, because Q had become such a big hit on their platform, they were either, um, pushing the Q narrative or paying other people to do it or had friends who would do it. That way the numbers would keep growing on their platform. Got it. So I have a quick question. So I don't know if you know the answer, but so are they based in the Philippines themselves or is the site just run through Philippines? Jim Watkins is in the Philippines. He is. Okay. He is. So Q I might don't... be in the Philippines. Q might be in the Philippines. Okay. I, I, mean, I don't totally new. understand Jim Watkins' whole situation. Fred had a lot to say. There was a really good Vice documentary where they interviewed him. Okay. And uh, he was talking about Jim a lot. And there's also been, he's been in other interviews where he is like, I 100% think it's Jim Watkins. Oh, really? And he's just trying to, uh, he's just trying to push his own, he's not even trying to push his own narrative. He's just trying to go with what everyone wants to see, which is QAnon shit. Sure. And I'm going to get into this later about like what, the personality traits are of people who usually fall into this kind of thing. Gotcha. Um, but one of them happens to be, if you're really Christian, apparently Fred has been like, Jim Watkins was never religious. I never knew him to be religious at all. But now if you follow like his individual social media stuff, it's all very Christian. It's almost like he's trying to uh-huh. lure in people. Um, okay. Also like his son, Ron, who's also big on the platform. Um, he's really into like yoga and ambient electronica music. And then Q all of a sudden like randomly started posting yoga stuff with that music in the background. Can you imagine? You're like, dad, can I please just share my newest electronica (laughs) beat on, on your website, please? Just one link. I just need a little bit of a viewership. Well, so a lot of the, a lot of, especially Fred, but a lot of people also think that like a lot of the tenants or some of like Q's more random breadcrumbs or q drops they all very much followed suit to like something that jim or ron would be interested in also jim jim watkins loved the protocols (gasps) Ugh, god what a creep uh i don't know if he well i don't want to get in trouble and say that he loved the protocols and was incredibly anti-semitic but let's say just say that but yeah okay scrap that (laughs) he i will say he according to fred he definitely knew about the protocols and he was very aware of conspiracy theories so he whether or not he loved it or liked it he definitely knew about it and was definitely pushing the narrative okay okay so um which is more than a lot of people so yeah so i take it back he was he didn't love the protocols however he did we don't know we don't know allegedly 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 um but apparently he definitely knew about it according to fred okay similarly there were a lot of tweets on jim or i i guess on ron's personal twitter that was almost identical to shit that q was then saying like within the same couple hours or within like a <laughs> smooth he's trying yeah. to get his own uh followers count up like what is he I doing yeah. it's well stupid. it sounds like ron was posting these things first and then they would randomly show up on q and then like ron's original post would get deleted so it looks like <laughs> okay it, it looks like okay so maybe jim and ron are q because they're posting the same shit on different yeah. feeds and then hiding one of them um oh, so anyway Fred, this is a quote from Fred where he says, I definitely, definitely 100% believe that Q either knows Ron or Jim Watkins or was hired by Ron or Jim Watkins. And some of their friends do include uh, Paul Ferber, who was one of the original three who spread Q all over media. Oh, dear. So people think, like, it's interesting that you two are friends. Also, so I said this last episode, but Q originally came out on a on 4chan but in a specific thread called calm before the storm right which is a whole other q fucking thing but q came out on a thread called calm before the storm which was ran 
by Paul Ferber, who also oh. then ran with the Q stuff and spread it all over mass media. And he's friends with Jim Watkins. Yeah, so again, G- which then was, owned the platform, who then owned the platform that this yeah. whole thing so then, moved to. So, yeah, and Jim Watkins. So he's known the original person who spread Q shit from gotcha. the beginning. So it's like a lot of things click to make it very shady. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Ron and Jim have said, I don't know anything about that. So, like, they're like, I we run an actual anonymous website. We don't know who Q is. But then you could easily say, well, that's what someone who was Q would say. Well, sure. You know? Yeah, exactly. That doesn't prove you innocent <clears throat> at all. Um, so I've got two more little categories. I'm sorry. This is so long. No, take I just... your time, dude. I'm fascinated. I can sit here all day. <laughs> I'm I'm so sorry also to people. I keep repeating myself and I hear it, but I just feel like there's so much wild bullshit I'm trying to say so quickly. That <laughs> no, I need it. I need to like process it, you know? I, I just feel it's like helpful. it's... Okay, good. No, I, you're doing it. You're not repeating yourself. And if you are, I'm only getting it once. So it's it's clicking so, somewhere. I, I feel myself. I'm looking at my bullets and every time I'm going through a new bullet, it's like, I already said that a couple minutes ago. But, but then I feel it's like, like you're just saying it in a way that is more digestible. Just, you know, I'm trying to remind myself like where the hell this comes from. Like what, yeah. what point I'm trying to make. So anyway, this new category is called personalities most likely to fall for a conspiracy (gasps) theory. Oh boy, oh boy. And by conspiracy theory, I do mean genuinely conspiracy theories at first. Oh, any. Any. Okay. Um, This kind of, this episode morphed from QAnon to conspiracy theories in general because I then wanted in the next episode to say why I personally think that this is a cult. Gotcha. (laughs) Um, <laughs> that's gonna be your like thesis statement my in conclusion, in conclusion. Uh, this is a cult um <laughs> so this is personalities of people who fall for conspiracy theories slash q like mm-hmm. it, i mean that's that's included in this umbrella so the first one right away is that conspiracy theories usually kind of pop up in general during civil unrest mm. which uh hi <laughs> it's, hey what's up <laughs> so it's when a lot of people are feeling out of control when they're feeling alone when they're looking for answers sure. and it certainly helps when they have nothing but time on their hands and uh-huh. hello part of the civil unrest is a year-long quarantine oh, so uh really the the perfect storm in many ways because i don't i think i'll get into it more next week but it there really is something to be said about the climate that we're in and how it just couldn't be more perfect Mm. for breeding conspiracy. Because if we weren't in a pandemic, if the coronavirus didn't exist, Q might exist, but it would not be as fuck. I mean, it would still exist because it existed before the pandemic, but it would not be what it is today. The only reason it got where it is is because everyone was home alone, bored and desperate for social. Yeah. It's like fuel to the fire. Yeah. So we'll get into that a little bit later, but so those are some of the main personalities, uh, personality traits. Um, usually you have to be on the end of a political spectrum. Uh, the more extreme you are on either end, the more likely you are to fall into a uh, conspiracy theory. And that that includes Democrats and liberals. A lot of people think that this is all Republicans and all conservatives. But surprisingly, a lot of QAnon people started as Bernie supporters. They were all really disappointed when Hillary beat Bernie out um, at the DNC or for the DNC. And so they were online talking about it and very quickly swayed by anti-Clinton mm. content. And this anti-Hillary Clinton content leads you to Pizzagate. So, right. Uh, right. Which and then how last... do you, like you said, how do you say you turn away from human trafficking at that point? Like, yeah, exactly. In their words. Yeah. So it, Ugh. it, people fall into it really fast and anyone is uh, capable of this. So I don't want to just blame mm-hmm. Trump supporters, even though I sure would like to. Um, But (laughs) some people on the winning team also end up on the losing team, in my opinion. So, Wow, that was deep and beautiful. I don't know about that. I expect someone who voted for Trump to yell at me on Twitter now. But Well, they do anyway. I mean, that's not new for us. (laughs) That's old news. (laughs) So uh, at first, a lot of people who were in QAnon, because... To me, QAnon is only as old as this pandemic because that's as early as I'd been hearing about it personally. Sure. That's when it was like more mainstream, right? Like that's when it kind of... It became more mainstream in 2018, but as of 2020 is the big boom, the big QAnon boom. Got it. Okay. 
And that's where in my head it lives. But I do have to remember that QAnon has been around since Pizzagate, so 2016. So there right. are people who have been in QAnon for years. Um, and at first, in those early years, the first people involved, um, and even early on in our in this pandemic, and I would still say the majority of people uh, falling for QAnon, are older, white, Christian, conservative, Trump voters. But because of the pandemic and social media, QAnon has swept into all different audiences. Mm. Um, and I want to take this moment, too, to remind you that, yes, this is a conspiracy theory, which I think has turned into a cult. But uh, this is also a we're watching we're we're in the middle of a history right here where we're watching people mm. become brainwashed day by day. Um, and a lot of people want to say, which I know we've addressed before when it comes to you covering cults, a lot of people want to say, oh, how could you be so stupid to fall for this shit? But like anyone of any intelligence can be brainwashed. Totally. Um, it's just different narratives that people follow just that lead you to the same thing. Away. Yeah. Yes. So... Um, no matter how smart you are, you can accidentally fall into something like this. And it is true. Statistically, those with lower educations are more likely. Um, there are some, Oh, did I keep the stats? It was it, the, I didn't keep the stats, but there was a surprising amount of surveys of people falling for QAnon who not only had finished high school or college, but had post-grad degrees. I mean, mm -hmm. every, all, all groups of people are falling for this. Um, other personality traits are high levels of insecurity, high levels of anxiety, uh -oh. feelings. Uh, uh oh, I know. Uh -uh. Um, feelings of anxiety, anger, feelings of isolation, a need for a purpose, a need for control, especially when the world feels out of control, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a need for validation in your own theories, uh -huh. and the need for feeling special. So uh -huh. interesting. Sure. Uh, and there's nothing more special than thinking you've cracked the code to a top secret, sec a top secret plan. Yeah, you know? and you're in on it. You you know the secret. You're in on it with other people. Yeah, totally. And if people don't believe you, that's exactly what the world wanted to happen anyway. So yeah. you're only validated by people not believing Completely. you because you are so above the you're echelon. A different that... echelon. <laughs> 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 what the fuck? We're trying to show our postgraduate degree. We're like, we know a big word. <laughs> the only thing I got out of uh, having a master's is I know the word echelon. Uh, that's me too, Em. We went, clearly apparently went to the same school because... Boston University, that is our five-star rating. We now know the word echelon because Thank of Thank you. you, by the way, for that. <laughs> I know how to hold far. a camera. That's pretty cool. Uh, okay, so... Those are uh, some other traits. And usually the more untrusting you are or the more anti-establishment or anti-authority you are, which is interesting to me because it's also the more like uh, militant or like a right, like wanting to be part of a. Yeah, it's weird because it's like two completely different things to me, but the same thing. Where interesting. Like, I don't know. I know what you mean. Anyway, I know what you mean. Thank you. I mean, I want uh, to be you, so probably nobody else gets it, but I get it. I speak you're on, your language. You have a, you're on another echelon, some might say. <laughs> wow, so, twice in one hey episode. God. Beautiful. So yeah, if you're really untrusting, if you are anti-establishment, also if you're really skeptical of science, if you have an interest in debate. Um, oh, I have is, none of those two, last two, so I'm out. Basically, what I'm the, uh, that's the nice way of me saying if you're a white man who likes playing devil's advocate. Like, yeah, I, um, actually. Well, actually, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, actually, uh, also, if you are arrogant or stubborn um, and I have said a... Aryan, I was like, well, we've covered oh, my... that. We have arrogant. covered that. Okay, I see. I see. I didn't put that on the list, but apparently <laughs> that does make some of the qualifiers. Uh, uh -huh, apparently so. So if you're arrogant or uh, stubborn, and by that I mean because once you have fallen for this, you are either too arrogant to think you're wrong or you're too stubborn to accept that you were wrong. Got you. Okay. Um. And if you have a big ego, because then you're going to have people validating how smart you are to have cracked the code. That's um, very fascinating because it's almost like you're insecure, but this is a dangerous combination of you're insecure, but you also think you're better than every, other people. You have a big ego. You're and you're looking level. for a group, but you're also, I mean, it's, yeah, that's a dangerous combination. It's really weird because it's like, really, I'm just describing any type of person. Like, it's like, yeah. you can be, you have a lot of anxiety and a lot of insecurity, but also you're wildly overconfident. So it's like. Or, like, you have a lot of fears, but also you fear nothing. Like, it's, like, what the fuck? Yeah, it's a also, very interesting polars. Yeah, polar. Also, yeah. I, I think this probably goes for most conspiracy theories that turn into cults. But I would say especially with the pandemic in this case, um, one of the 
I don't know if you'd call it a personality trait, but having mental health issues has mm-hmm, definitely... Mm-hmm. Uh, I call it a personality trait. I mean, <laughs> me I don't too. Know if it counts, but... <laughs> uh, if you have mental health issues, and by that I mean if you have anything that uh, is like... That allows depression to be a comorbidity. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Because depression, especially high-functioning depression, or actually any version of depression, will have you isolating yourself from people. Right. and anxiety will have you escaping into the internet to remove yourself from social interaction right um and during this year i mean raise your fucking hand if you've and been seriously. depressed you know and anyone's like, anyone yeah. can get in well and like looking for a purpose is interesting too especially now when people are like you said at home there's nothing to distract you if you lose mm-hmm. your job like so many people did you really you know what mm-hmm. else are you gonna do you're looking for i mean you're, also, you're gonna play the sims or you're gonna like find a conspiracy also to, because to the the age the age range of people being older and they're looking for a purpose not only is there a pandemic but a lot of people lost their jobs early or are retired so right. now it's like what's your new purpose like even yeah. if you didn't get fired but you still are out on a job um so it's basically if you've been depressed you have a chance of uh-oh. being sucked in so Our like entire uh-oh. podcast population <laughs> as far as i can tell we're all screwed if you hear anything about lizards just Uh-oh. look the other way. Look the other Unless way. Unless it's like when our listeners post cute photos of their actual lizards. Like Those are the only ones. to the podcast. <laughs> Let me see. Oh, and then the last one that is also pretty crucial is you don't have to fall into any of these categories, but these are just like little mm. signs. One of them is being uh, is having a high value in a religion and not to be someone who is like, you know, poo-pooing on religion because i don't care if you believe in whatever makes you happy at night and you're not hurting anybody or yourself i don't care but a lot of people could say that if you value religion you uh, have already been trained or primed to uh just kind of ride out blind faith in something that doesn't logically make sense sure so yeah um, i mean the faith aspect is huge you're right like something you can't see i mean i like and I don't personally, I don't ever really like use this term, but I've heard people before who are um, not religious say like, oh, so you like believe in like a man in the sky or like sky a talking daddy. snake. Sky, sky daddy. daddy. Like, and it, it to someone who is religious, it could be insulting, but to people who don't believe that stuff, it is easy to see sure. how illogical it can seem. But then you could argue the same thing with QAnon people of like, oh yeah, like of course I, if I can fall for, fall for that, I'm not, that's not my words, but I'm trying to paraphrase other people here. If you can fall for that, you can fall for something else that sounds kind I mean, of ridiculous to, to people fair, who aren't invested in it. To be fair, we believe in like ghosts and things yeah, that you can't exactly. see and uh, uh, time travel things that like have not been proven and we just blindly are like, nope, it's real, you know? Bingo. So. I mean, also like I'm, and this is a, a really good time because you kind of brought it up. This is a great time to mention that when I say anyone could get into QAnon, one of the reasons this is so toxic and dangerous right now is because anyone can get in. Yeah. If you have fucking depression, if you're scared about the state of the world, I mean, raise your goddamn hand. Yeah, yeah. If you believe in anything, I'm, I'm like ripe for the picking with QAnon. Like, you cannot convince me otherwise that time travel doesn't exist. Right. I gotta believe there's a faction of QAnon who are ready to talk to people about time travel and then work you into Q, totally you know? there's probably some quantum shit in there which would get me <laughs> talking yeah. you know exactly so i mean anyone this is i'm just listing some of the more common things that people have uh, said before um there are a lot of former QAnon people who are now speaking out and a lot of them had said that they grew up christian in the beginning this is again not poo-pooing on christians um this is just the people who have come out and talked about what brought them in a yeah. lot of them will say that their faith got them in, but a lot of people have also said that their faith got them out. So there's oh. that. One person is quoted saying, Christianity played a role in my being primed to believe that something was outlandish uh, or, some, or to believe something out, outlandish at all. The fact that you can have that kind of faith in things leads you to open leads you to be open and to believing things without there necessarily being proof. Mm -hmm. And then another former QAnon person who grew up in the faith said, quote, theories about evil evolution, science denial, and the end of the world rapture, return of Christ stuff is all pretty crazy too. I was just Um, thinking creationism, like it's an extreme, you know, form of belief system. And if one of the like, 
One of, if one of the big things that they're trying to lure people in with in their core beliefs of QAnon, first of all, is that the bad people are anti-Christian. Right. Is the real core of it. And also, uh, like, all these weird little terms, like the storm and the Great Awakening and mm-hmm. things that, like, already kind of play True. into religion. Very revelations, like, end of days stuff. It's very easy to coax people in who already know that lingo you know? yes totally and, the, and totally. for them it's a comfort like a lot of religious people um they they have religion because it's a comfort to them and to explain events in the world and yeah, a lot of people yeah. looking into conspiracy theories are looking for answers about what's going Completely. on in the world like so some when, control like you said yeah so when a conspiracy theory when their answers are you know they sound a little faith-based and like, oh, mm-hmm. well, there's a storm coming. There's an awakening. There's going to be a utopia. Everything is happening for a reason. There's a plan. Mm-hmm. It's really easy for people who already grew up with those thoughts to be like, oh, well, this sounds like right up my alley and it totally. feels like a, like a comfort zone. Also, the good versus evil trope. You're already kind of, you've oh, been sure. primed into that. QAnon specific. Um, if you believe in a conspiracy theory, you can probably be learned into Q, like I just said about me and time travel, you and <laughs> quantum physics. Um, one of the worst slash best things, one of the worst things in terms of how insidious it is, but one of the best things for people recruiting others into QAnon is that according to the BBC, this is a quote of theirs, uh, QAnon is just an amalgamation of all the greatest conspiracy theories thrown into one big belief. So if you believe anything fucking crazy, sure. you're invited to the party. And all that's just going to be the faction you focus most on. Interesting. So, like, you can be part, you can be like, oh, I don't believe in all that, but like, I believe yeah. this part of it. Okay. One of the funniest things to me is that QAnon, there are groups of people who they all swear by Q, they think Trump is their savior, blah, blah, blah. But in terms of like, oh, oh like, another conspiracy theory that's pretty popular they'd be like that's fucking stupid though you're a crazy person for thinking that but anyway the lizard people right every- right, right 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 so it in that way and i mentioned this later i'm really going off cue here or off topic but off cue <laughs> off cue why did i <laughs> i don't know but i like it they're they're oh getting God. in my fucking head oh no um, somebody get a helicopter extraction going <laughs> but they uh but one of the things is that like you can you don't have to believe in all the same stuff, which kind of makes it feel more anti-cult because you're not being led to believe all the same stuff. You're almost getting Ah. permission to, as long as you believe in this one thing, you can believe in anything else. Sure. So there's, there's almost, um, it's less strict than what Mm -hmm. a normal cult might be. Plus there, another personality trait or another quality of a person that makes you more susceptible to this is that if you believe in a conspiracy theory, the the most telling way that you can believe in a conspiracy theory is if you already believe in another one like it sure it's once you believe in one it's a slippery slope and it's sure the likelihood of you be the likelihood of you being able to fall for something else is so is massive the significance yeah. is crazy <clears throat> this one guy who did an ama on reddit he was an ex QAnon person he was answering a bunch of people's questions he said a quote at this point, the problem isn't Q. It's gullible people who lack critical thinking skills and gain a massive ego boost and thinking they have a secret. It's worth noting that conspiracy thinking hooks the brain because it feels like critical thinking, even though it isn't. Ah, uh, right. Because you're piecing together clues and for sure. But the clues are sense. fucking nonsensical. But if you're piecing them together, you're smarter than everyone else. Yeah, or it's just it's <clears throat> sensical, but you're ignoring a bunch of other information that would disqualify it. This is all one quote, but uh, from the article I read about his AMA, they called him DB in this because his handle it is DB. DB avoids the rabbit hole now because he's an ex member. Mm-hmm. DB avoids the rabbit hole now by embracing doubt and as as he added, some fucking worldview humility. So oh. he's just added into his own in his own thinking his own critical thinking that like he might just be wrong sometimes like interesting he said uh quote the problem with fundamentalist religions cults and conspiracy theories is they all demonize doubt and all and are all so absolutely certain that they have the total truth of reality figured out i hold my beliefs now more humbly and i acknowledge that i could be wrong as one of the big tricks or one of the big suggestions or on how to get someone out is to just get them to accept that you can doubt things right and that's a hard thing to do i mean i get that like if you're really believing something it can be hard to be like maybe i'm wrong i get that Mm -hmm. yeah i I, 
I mean, that there's just... <sighs> For those people who really wanted a long episode or say you love them, here you go. So the <laughs> A lot the of you next, say it. This is your time to prove it. Okay. The next, the last section is how people got sucked in and how they act once they're in the cult, which I called it a cult. It's technically a conspiracy theory. It's, my opinion is different. But how people got sucked in and how they act once they're in the conspiracy theory of mm-hmm. QAnon. Again, it's usually people got sucked in because this was a time of unrest and when tensions were incredibly high in society and in politics and 2020 was really just the perfect environment in terms of unrest. Usually people only need one thing in terms of civil unrest to start feeling out of control and seek answers. And right now, like, I can't even (laughs) list how many... I unmuted myself to laugh. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's just like... The, the fact that usually it only takes, like, one situation for people oh to god. start losing their mind and slipping away. Oh my and, god. And all of 2020 is just a fucking spiral. Uh, it's, like, spiral. not funny, but it's funny because it's so not funny. Oh my god. No, I mean, it's absolute nervous laughter of, yeah, like... it's horrific. Like, wow, it would only take one issue to make you become uh, a conspiracy theorist? Well, here's 2020 where everyone is spiraling in their own way. And I didn't get this from any... Um, any articles or anything. So I don't want people to think I'm referencing an actual phrase, but I, through my research have um, considered that this is like in terms of cults or conspiracy theories, um, this is like the first real internet scandal or digital cult, maybe to me, because there was a mass hysteria and desperation for some sort of solace or a community when there was none for anybody, the entire world just shut down and everyone was desperate for an answer Um, And so most stories of people joining QAnon during the pandemic is just they had nothing but time on their hands and they got quickly sucked down rabbit holes. Mm -hmm. And originally, like I said, older folks were more likely to be in QAnon because they actually didn't know what rabbit holes were. They like don't understand algorithms Um, on top of that, like just not understanding like how quickly you can fall into something on the internet because you just like kind of lack the digital literacy. There is an ex neo-Nazi that's been going on a bunch of interviews discussing how like her stance on QAnon and uh, her name's Shannon Foley Martinez. And this is a quote of hers from a news interview. She said, QAnon folks tend to be middle-aged and older people who feel like they're tech savvy, but they aren't actually. So their ability to fact check is often limited and they think they're doing it right. So Mm. it's, just a combination of pretty much baby boomers who don't know how potent the internet can be thinking they're doing proper research, which is ironic because they were like the people who told us to not trust anything on the internet. Yeah. That's a good and point. now, <laughs> so that's a good point. And a lot of younger people, because we were all, we're all in a pandemic and it started seeping into other um, age groups. Usually the people our age who get invested in this are part of like new age Facebook groups or things like that. And then through the algorithm, they're only one or two clicks away from oh God. page from pages like The Great Awakening. Because oh God. there was one person, her name was Melissa, but she f- truly found QAnon and was like a huge, like huge in QAnon, like super radicalized. And it was because uh, she followed a bunch of like Facebook pages about like frequencies and energies. And, I mean, how quickly can we fall <laughs> yep. down that hole? Oh God, I just got goose care. Like I need to check my Facebook page. <laughs> and her algorithm said like, here's a page you might be interested in. It was just called The Great Awakening, which sounds very like lingo like energy. That. Yeah, totally. And before she knew it, she was a mesh <laughs> in the goddamn community. And oh so, my God. <laughs> um, because it's it just starts with like energy blah 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 and then it's like oh you know these people know how to do energy this way and oh, oh did you know that this is energy that Trump uses and then it becomes like this huge like Trump is our savior and he is the light and all this bullshit Ooh. so um <laughs> so there's one company called Graphica and they're like a social media analysis group and they said that since QAnon uh is easily and vaguely anti-establishment it can seep into just so many fucking algorithms because everyone in one way or another is fuck the system and so well, most it best, of us, i would say but... most of us yeah <laughs> uh, probably but, if you listen to this show yeah probably if you listen to the show at, at least after 2020 all of us have a problem in one well, way or right. another with you're, how things fair. are going that's fair. yeah and so because q is anti-establishment or anti-government and at least one way or another each faction has their own way of feeling angry Mm. at the government or the system or whatever you want to say 
so they can just go find really anyone and have something to talk about. And it's apparently Graphica, they, what they found was that uh, QAnon people best seep into people through spirituality and religion forums. Oh, oh boy. And their quote is that uh, people are often most vulnerable when they're seeking spiritual information online and more susceptible to alternate views because you're already opening yourself up to things you don't totally understand. Of course. Um, so ironically, some folks just got sucked in. This is just a whole other faction of people that joined QAnon. They are people who were the probably 99% a uh, white man who wanted to be devil's advocate and they fell into QAnon because they were looking through forums to have ammo when they created online debates. If they wanted to deal fight with a liberal online and they oh, wanted I their see. own facts, they would be like, do your research. And then the, all of a sudden they very quickly fell into QAnon because they were looking for more. Their source usually or whatever. Right wing sources. Sure. And once you're looking at right wing sources, very quickly, QAnon becomes an option in your algorithm. Not to say that if you are right-winged, you are QAnon, but it only takes like one or two less clicks to end up in that kind of stuff mm. in terms of algorithms. Um, so once you're in the cult, um, you can... Or Sorry, I keep saying cults. I'm sorry. <laughs> Look, after next week, you guys will all feel the fucking same. But <laughs> once you're in QAnon... Um, you are quickly immune to fact checking because the whole point right. is that you can't trust anyone. Right. You don't trust your facts, which is ironic because people are like looking for facts and researching, but you shouldn't trust research. But like, I guess if you I don't think, trust science, that's like its own form of, I guess it, in from what I've seen, the don't trust research is like, don't trust people who are backing mass media because they're affiliated with the human sex trafficking rings. And totally. if you're listening to those big corporations, then either you're falling for what they're pumping out to distract yeah, yeah. you or you're enabling it or whatever. So I think mm -hmm. it's the less credible the source is, the more homemade it is and the less it's been affiliated with pedophiles and sex rings and lizard people. Sure. So therefore yeah, you can trust say. that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I always say. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just trust the most fringe and cringe, you know? Um, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> it's very easy to trap yourself in confirmation bias because mm -hmm. for, well, there's one quote here that says QAnon is such a good story. Like this insider is leaking secret government information. So of course, like people are fascinated and want to know, even if you at first don't believe it, you just want to be in on the scoop. I mean, of, like, that sounds like something you and I would like yeah. chat about for fun if it weren't obviously so sinister, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, but even then, like we could easily fall into it because we don't realize it's sinister or even if they're saying crazy things, it would be something to almost laugh at with your friends if you don't know the context of like, I can't believe someone's saying this shit. And then all they have to say is one thing that you kind of agree with and they've hooked you. Yeah. Um, and if anyone, once you like find out that there's like this secret government guy and he's leaking information, if anyone doubts the secret info, I already said this earlier, but it just means that their eyes haven't been opened the way yours are. Mm. You just, you're ahead of the game. And so when people doubt you, they'll figure mm. it out eventually. But for now, like you're, you're on top of it. Eesh. Um, and so with internet and social media, you can find pretty much any information you want to confirm anything you believe. So even if it's wrong information, if your goal is confirmation bias and your goal is I have this crazy theory and if I have to do my own research from sources that aren't part of mass media, you can probably find, quote, bad information or fringe information anywhere. Oh, yeah. If you're looking hard enough for it. Um Especially when the goal is to avoid credible sources right. and you're just looking for other people maybe in their basement with the same thought and now you, you have yeah. who agree with you. Um, and now, by the way, like, it's not just people in your basement. It's all these fucking people who've been infiltrated mm -hmm. and now they're like just involved in our society. They're fucking doctors and lawyers and shit and yeah, politicians. Yeah, normal so. everyday people. So the more people that get invested in it, the more people are pumping out their own sources for you to agree with them on. And so it just gets, it's so chaotic so quickly. It just snowballs. Yeah. Um, and people have noted that it's very similar to a choose your own adventure game or <laughs> uh, like an alternate reality game, which by the way, by the way, those do really well amongst like 
the original lonely 4chan anonymous people. I mean, they're like, I'm totally stereotyping here, but a lot, <laughs> a lot of people are into like, um, and this isn't just 4chan anonymous people, even people our age, like people are into like the, the Dungeons and Dragons kind of stuff of like, if you're someone who's online looking for attention, looking for control and someone saying, you're the dungeon master. It's like fantasy role play stuff. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like, it's so seductive. Like, I yeah. totally get why people would be about that. Like, oh, you mean this is a belief system I get to be in control of and help create? I mean, it's sure fantastical. There was one Wired article about an actual alternate reality game developer who says that QAnon behaves like an ARG because it's clue cracking. Oh. It is uh, a, a multi-platform scavenger hunt. Oh. It, cre it creates realities that uh, for people in, that are sometimes bigger than yourself. So you feel like you're powerful by creating something so powerful. Plus, it this is still part of this quote, plus it turns one's armchair warrior Googling into a heroic quest for mm -hmm. truth. Mm -hmm. And if players solve one puzzle, they crave the fun of tackling more and more and more. So, Makes I mean, total it, sense. how on earth can you not want to be a part of QAnon if that's the angle you get seeped in with of like, here's a fucking escape room, figure it out. Like, and or it's here's like, like real a, life. It's not and just it's, like a game. It's like... Yeah, You're really cracking a, the real code and saving babies. <laughs> and yeah, and then think about like the uh, the camaraderie of like everyone joined together. There's like a, a almost like a brotherhood or something mm -hmm. of like we saved the world or we're on our way to save the world. I mean, I I'm talking about it and I'm excited about it and I don't even want to join. You know, like <laughs> I can hope you not. imagine? Can you imagine like how quickly someone could fall into that? So yes, absolutely. So one of the issues with QAnon on social media is that every single day QAnon becomes a new fucking thing because new breadcrumbs are released. Um, people's interpretations are varied. More people are joining. So more interpretations are muddling other interpretations. And basically you're every single day, the narrative is changing because everyone's got their hand in designing the newest belief or the newest breadcrumb that has to do with another conspiracy. It's right. just a web tangling into webs, into webs, into webs. And um, this makes it really hard for people who are trying to get loved ones out or um, even like data scientists trying to keep track of this shit. It's really hard to monitor and it's really hard to shake people out of this because you get invested so quickly. If on day one you're the dungeon master and you're fucking solving puzzles and saving babies <laughs> by like fucking day 10 like it's too late you've already like convinced yourself of all of these different worlds you've probably invested a lot of time and energy so much time so yeah. much energy and so with all of the time that you've invested and all of the the clues that you have found yourself realizing <clears throat> it's so quickly it's so it's too late to mm -hmm. back out Plus, if someone doesn't agree with you, just tell them to do their own research. It's based, <laughs> This is just, QAnon is just a stadium of stubborn people saying, I'm right. Like, and like, if yeah. you're, if you don't believe me, you just haven't done the research, which means they're all also conflicting with each other. It's right. just a belief system that says everyone's right. Everyone's wrong if they don't think you're right. And everyone needs to do their research. And if they don't do the same research you did, then they're still stuck. And stupid they're doing the or wrong unaware. Research. Or, but, yeah, yeah. It's, there's no fucking rhyme or reason. And so um, that, like I said earlier, it's unlike a cult because it gives you the freedom to believe whatever you want, and it, even if it's different from other people in the same movement. Mm -hmm. um, but it, again, all stems from this big Hollywood sex ring human trafficking situation. So mm -hmm. like, that's all you really need to agree with ultimately one day, even if it sounds extreme now, if you get there everyone involved in QAnon is just doing their own research and their own faction. Um, and on top of it, they have a fucking public figure, Trump, mm -hmm. a literal fucking president, one of the most powerful people in the country or in the world, not denouncing you, which is enough to bolster their beliefs and their movement. And they feel their loyalty solidified and their opinions validated. And in QAnon, Trump also, a reminder, is their leader in saving babies from human trafficking so to challenge a QAnon follower with comments of stupid things trump said it's not going to work because it's their leader it's their savior it's someone who is leading code so of course you think what he's saying is stupid because uh -huh. you haven't figured out the messages he's actually relaying um so it just makes them double down and so they're it also helps them affirm their own belief that trump stands for the same things if you know, you happen to be someone who thinks the election was a fraud or COVID was man-made or 
all these other little things that QAnon says on their own, and then Trump is on TV saying the same thing, you're like, my God, my superhero is confirming that I'm on the right path here. Totally. Totally. It's And so uh, if you had those opinions and now he's saying them, of course you feel validated. And a lot of lost people uh, believe that their purpose is... Or people think that they have found purpose when they were already lost. They found their purpose in QAnon. So now if you're threatening QAnon or challenging them or saying it's stupid, you're it's a threat to their own self-identity. Mm-hmm. And the time they've invested, like you said, the community who understands them, the community who's helping them save people and challenging them just doesn't work, which makes it very similar to cults. Totally. Because all you're doing is helping them dive deeper into the community that they should be running from. Right, like dig their heels in. Yeah. Yeah. So... When your belief system is that the more pushback you're getting, the more you're onto something that they don't want you to know, it is just, again, on top of an already perfect storm with how wild the last year has been and everyone's home and looking for social interaction and all that. And on top of it, the reasoning is, or the on top of that, your new, your new belief system is if people say you're wrong, you're right. Mm, it's, it's just vicious, like, yeah. It's, I mean, there's no escaping it. So I feel like I just keep saying the same thing over and no, over again. No, but it's like it's, fast. It's like every time I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so when there was one time, there have been a few things. I'll talk about social media next week, but social media has tried to change their policies or add fact checking whenever like misinformation was spread. And QAnon just saw that as a good thing and not because like they were being fact checked, but because it meant that they were doing something right, that they had scared Facebook into uh-huh. now sh- shoving additional <laughs> fake news Which is news probably out. the enemy of like the yeah. media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also that's a credible source to some people, whatever, but it's like, be- <laughs> okay, it's fair. a credible source because it's not a credible source, I guess. <laughs> oh but, but so to them, they saw that as a win because even though they were being attacked, they were... Because they were being censored and uh, media was trying to reroute people's attention or distract them with this information, it was because the information that they were onto was so right that even the media is starting to feel Mm -hmm. rattled. And uh, every challenge to their logic is just affirmation that they found the real truth and they just don't want you to pay attention to it, which by the way, leads to things like wearing masks. Like when all of those people out there who are anti-maskers and they scream fake news at you, what they're saying is when you are wearing a mask, you're listening to the media tell you to wear a mask, mm-hmm. which means you're you're listening to the media and you're blind to reality and you're enabling the deep state, which is the people <laughs> wrangling all of this human sex trafficking. Oh, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when I, in my head before all this studying though, I'd be like, how is screaming fake news actually even logical? And then- after hearing all that, it's like, I understand your process, your thought so, like, process. Like twisted, to... yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when QAnon also implies that news sources are basically the devil because they're part of Hollywood and, you know, news sources are part of mass media and the sex ring. I mean, it's just, it's wild. So people in QAnon go against credible sources, aka fake news, because those are the sources working with Hollywood to hide the truth. Mm-hmm. Um, you can trust, you can't trust the fake news if... Uh, if they're just trying to distract you from the real issues. And one of my favorite quotes is from that Vice documentary I mentioned. One of the documentarians said, quote, all these people are acting like this is a grassroots movement, but it's some 4chan guy who just put ideas in their head. So I love that because it's like all these people think that they really have just grown into this thing where they're a, a massive force to be reckoned with, which sadly they are becoming. But it's all because potentially some guy in his basement got taken too seriously one time. So basically when these people are challenged, they, it's easier to, you've talked about this before on with cults, but, and which is why another reason I think this is a cult personally, and that is not anyone else's opinion, but when they're challenged on their beliefs, it's so much easier to fill gaps in your current belief system than than to realize that your belief system has gaps. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And so the more you're able to rationalize your own thoughts basically means that you're looking for random fucking information to fill in the holes just so you can keep thinking the way you do, which means you're just falling deeper and deeper into a conspiracy, especially as a movement that tells you to do your own research because if something just, if someone challenges you and you have to think about it because something actually is a crack of doubt. It just means it's their, it's their way of saying like, oh, that's not a crack of doubt. That's not a hole in the system. That's not a, a gap in your thinking. You just haven't done enough research yet to justify it for when people challenge you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So 
even in other belief systems, or maybe this is the same in all cults or whatever, or conspiracy theories, but if it's just another way of doubling down where like finally there's like a, a shed of light of realization that something could be wrong. But this group specifically is telling you do research to make it make sense and, and right. make that make that doubt go. Away. And that research exists. So And it exists somewhere. Maybe it doesn't it, maybe it's like the shadiest, weirdest YouTube video you've ever seen. But if it if it patches up that hole, ride with it. Yeah, so yeah. and once you've justified your beliefs, however you do it, you're your belief is reinforced and you're you're in the know and everyone else are just sheeple because they haven't done the research as intensely as you have Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one poster uh on the ama that an ex QAnon person did another person wrote in the comments saying the uh, i guess he was also an ex QAnon person by the way because the way he's talking about it he says quote the idea behind the research is that you are more likely to believe a source that you stumble upon versus if i tell you to watch this video right. if i tell you that hillary is a lizard person watch this video it's easy to dismiss me as crazy but if i tell you i think hillary is a lizard person but don't take my word for it and you come across hundreds of videos and articles about how hillary oh. is a lizard person it makes it all more believable especially since there's so many articles now of hillary not being a lizard person <laughs> because because if it wasn't true why would people make videos and articles having to debunk it yikes, yikes. so it's almost like a reverse reinforcement of yes. like if people are arguing the opposite that means something there's a they're arguing there. against something right exactly yeah. oh my god that's so horrifying to boost their own ego and keep them feeling empowered um conspiracy theories basically make quote followers think that they're thinking more critically when they're actually thinking less critically and that's what I've got today. It, it literally like two fucking hours in, and I'm so sorry, but that's no, what I've I got just, today. Wow! I just want you to tell me more. <laughs> well, I have the categories already for next week's notes, and there, and I quote because they're from my own document. By the way, called "I Want to Fucking Die" because <laughs> oh no, because I was trying to rack my brain and read like literally a hundred pages of notes to get through this. But uh, the topics are: How did this mega conspiracy theory spread so damn fast? political consequences ways it's like a cult and how to help someone get out so if you're interested i'll take in any ways of those... it's like a cult for 400 Alex, thank you. <laughs> it sounds like jeopardy categories if you would like to hear any of those things about QAnon, please tune in next week for the final uh oh. section which will be shorter by the way this was the longer bit of that so wow oh my I'm... god it's so creepy i'm gonna have the weirdest dreams tonight i appreciate everyone hanging in there but it's just this Usually I would try to trim things for the sake of not having such a long episode, but this is something that I think a lot of people that listen to our show don't realize how many people that listen to our show are being personally affected. But I can tell you, especially after last week's episode, mm-hmm. I already thought that some people might be hurt because during Tea Time Tuesday, a lot of people say that they're dealing with QAnon parents right now. Mm-hmm. And then after the last episode came out, so many more people than I even suspected mm. are saying that they they needed this. Um, so hopefully I did it some justice and I didn't offend anybody or anything, but a lot of people really need to hear this information to help maybe save the, or if they feel like they're responsible for it, um, saving people in their worlds. So thank you to everyone who <sighs> is sticking with it. And even if you're not uh, attached to this world at all, at least you're being educated because maybe someone in your life might hear about this kind of stuff and you can stop it in advance now. So sure. Yeah. Maybe like they'll approach you with something similar and you'll just know. spreading the good news or really the bad news so that you can keep it from becoming worse Ooh. news, you know? Yeah, totally. The end, I the get end, it. the end. Holy cannoli. I'm <sighs> scared now. I like have to go pee, but I'm scared to leave. <clears throat> Are you ready? I'm ready. Are you ready? I am. I wanted so welcome to finally Christine's portion where I still monopolize this conversation for a second because I wanted to sh- I wanted to show you something for people watching the YouTube. You'll appreciate this. Be- What's the that? YouTube. Yes. <laughs> uh oh, boomer. Okay. Uh, if you uh, if you're watching YouTube, you get to see it with your own eyes. But I wanted to show you my this the gift my stepsister got me for Christmas finally came in. What is it? And I just could not be more in love with it it's just so it fucking wild and fish? weird i don't want to see it no it's a shirt it's a t-shirt okay but i just want to show you it because it like gets me every time it's so fucking random and wild <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is 
is that? It's for those of you who can't tell, it looks like a like an occult sacrifice. It, it looks like pagan fucking... circle. It's it's like it looks like an upside down pentacle with like Baphomet's skull in it. Yep. And it's on fire, and it says Celine Dion. My heart will go on, and it looks like the skull is eating a heart. It like has or a literal organ. <laughs> What the fuck? I I just love it so much. I can't wait to wear it. And so my... Just, I almost you know, called you Renee, which should tell you like how I'm feeling. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? What the fuck is your name? Oh, my, my God. My name is Celine Dion, bitch. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, my other friend I almost said was Celine. I was like, this sounds like something. I know. You, they would... This is wild. This is next level shit. I'm, when I wear this shirt, I will only go by Celine Dion. Oh, and... my God. Look at that bloody font. It makes me so happy. And so baby baby steps and little rewards and treat yourself. But after re- reporting on QAnon, my uh, present to myself was I was going to take a nice hot shower after this episode and I'm going to put on my Celine Dion shirt. So I'm very excited about it. I totally approve and you deserve that. And I hope you don't have to do any work tonight. I'm going to have to re-listen to this episode again tomorrow, but I will drink enough tonight that I forget and then I'll listen again and it'll be all new. To be honest, I'm so paranoid about how I just covered QAnon that I'm mm-hmm. probably after this going to go back and listen to the Garage Band file just Do to make sure that I while you're doing did it justice. <laughs> <laughs> while you're there. Uh, <laughs> while I'm there. Um, no, I think you did a great job. And I think everyone's going to back me up on that. Well, and tell me your story. I, I mean, I, I would I really... say that no matter what, obviously, but I, I'm being very sincere. I um, appreciate that. I'm not lying. Because if I, I'm like, just, I told M before the, the break ended, quote unquote, but if I'm drinking and I followed it, like, you were doing something <laughs> really well and well, correctly. Like I said earlier, it's just, I, I very rarely, I don't think ever have talked about anything as serious as anti Semitism as my topic when usually it's like Jeff the Talking Mongoose. So <laughs> I just, I'm just extra paranoid because I'm out of my comfort zone. So much and more wanting problematic to do it area. Justice. Yeah. 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 And sensitive so. and touchy. And... Exactly. So on that note, I want to hear it. Um, Badly. Just, just another, just another topic from my end of the, the world. Badly. Yes. Mm. This is actually probably one, you know, <gasps> Oh, what? This is the story of Kitty Genovese. Nope. You know okay. You will. Oh, Okay. I'm like 99% sure you will. You'll see why. Is, is it Virginia or something? No. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I want to know. Uh, okay. I'm going to tell you. So okay, we're going to start with the story and then lead into like the bigger picture here. So <gasps> okay, the story begins 1964, March 13th, 2.30 a.m. Catherine Susan Genovese, otherwise known as Kitty, who is a bar manager, left her bar Ev's 11th Hour on Jamaica Avenue and 193rd Street in Hollis, Queens. She drove home in her red Fiat, and while waiting at a traffic light on Hoover Avenue, she happened to be spotted by a man named Winston Mosley, who was sitting nearby in his parked car. Hmm. Okay. Kitty arrived home around 3.15 a.m., parked her car uh, in the railroad station parking lot about 100 feet from her apartment door, which uh, she could access via an alleyway at the rear of the building. And as she walked toward the apartment complex, Mosley, who had followed her home after spotting her, got out of his car, uh, which he had parked at a corner bus stop, and quickly caught up with her. He was armed with a hunting knife. (gasps) Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Seeing a man chasing after her with a knife, obviously Kitty ran toward her door as quickly as she could, but unfortunately Mosley overtook her, stabbed her twice in the back. (gasps) Uh, According to some neighbors, she screamed, Oh my God, he stabbed me. Help me. It was only when one of the neighbors, Robert Moser, shouted, let that girl alone, that Mosley ran away and Kitty slowly made her way toward the rear entrance of the building, which was out of sight from anybody who was watching or witnessing this. Wow. She, at this point, was seriously injured and in a critical position. Uh, However, okay, let me say this next line first. According to witnesses, Mosley got into his car and drove away. However, it gets worse. That's where I insert that famous Christine line. Don't worry. Also, question. So Uh this... Homie just stopped stabbing her when someone said, leave her alone. That was all it fucking took. Uh-huh. <laughs> and also did leave her alone guy go check on her? So that or did is... he just like go sit back in his fucking bark lounger and was like, anyway, back to my tunes. Well, you're hitting the, you're hitting the, the story right, right on the, 
Okay, okay. Head. Okay. I don't know. That's English isn't my first language. No. You'll figure it out. <laughs> it so, shows. <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> Thank you for agreeing for once. Um, <laughs> so, da, da, da. so he drove away. But then, 10 minutes later, he came back. Uh, okay. Yeah, he was hiding his face with a wide brimmed hat. <laughs> okay. Uh, That'll change things that, up. Okay. Now I don't recognize you at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't vividly remember the trauma of 10 minutes ago when that your face uh, stabbed me. Your Got dumb, it. dumb face showed up. Yeah. Uh, but now there's a hat <laughs> over it. So he hid his face from with a wide brimmed hat, began searching the parking lot, train station, and an apartment complex where he eventually found Kitty. This is horrifying. She was barely conscious and lying in a hallway at the back of the building where a locked door had prevented her from getting inside. Oh. So he then stabbed her several <gasps> more times. Then he sexually assaulted her, <gasps> stole $49 from her wallet, and ran away again. So he came back to the scene to find her and, like, quote-unquote, finish the job. First of all, can you imagine being kid? No one should, but can you imagine being Kitty and thinking it's finally done and you got like you're away? you inside, Yeah. Like, you made it. You're done. You're in your own building. Like, it's really next-level horror stuff. And imagine, like, I don't even know how to get into the mind of that guy, but for him to think, like, that wasn't enough. I needed that 49 fucking dollars. Just, like, what are you talking about? To drive away and come back. He's, like, so... And risk that after people saw you, like... Usually you would be so, like, adrenaline-ridden. I would imagine that, like, the last thing you can do is... I mean, you're in the, like, to me, fight or flight, and you're, like, gone. You're already... It's... It's you done escaped on both ends. it without getting caught. Like you already did the thing. Yes, yeah. exactly. Why would you come back? Okay. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's shocking. So, a neighbor and close friend named Sophia found Kitty shortly after and held her in her arms. Uh, the first call to police came in around three fifty a.m. and they showed up shortly. Showed up shortly after that. Uh, they then called for an ambulance who picked her up at four fifteen a.m. But tragically, she died on the way to the hospital. And she was buried on March 16th, 1964, in Lakeview Cemetery in New Canaan, Connecticut, near her family. And uh, only six days after killing, not only, six days after killing Kitty, Mosley was arrested during a house burglary that he was committing. Uh, And at the time of his arrest, get this, he was a pillar of the community. Uh, (laughs) He had been working a steady job, had no criminal record, and was married with two children. So just not your average criminal on the street you know except according to and that's why you drink definitely the your most criminal exact a- criminal your most you expect average criminal exactly exactly so from pillar to killer pillar starring to killer. emma and christine uh from <laughs> interviews with him it seemed like his killing was completely random which almost makes this more fucked up he later said he had simply quote wanted to kill a woman oh yeah that mm-hmm. Huh. The fact that it's so simple makes it so much worse. Doesn't it? It's like, it's, it's like. Because you don't even need a, you don't even need like a psychologist to do a whole history background. It's it's, just like, oh, matter of fact, I just wanted to do it. It's like senseless. It's like, there's not even logic or anything. It's just random. It's, I think, I think as, as what I consider like typical human beings in terms of empathy um, and like having emotion and not wanting to kill anybody, it's. I feel like we cling to wanting an explanation. Yes, and yes, when yes, someone yes, doesn't yes. give it to you, it's just like extra fucking difficult to process because it's so, so not the natural way. We don't get it. It's like that Israel Key story where he just casually flew around the country and picked a couple. Doesn't matter what age, yeah. doesn't matter what city they live in, what gender, what race. None of it matters. It was just like random, which is so it's, much scarier. It's so much scarier. And also like you think like, you never want to compare crimes or like compare like victims or anything like that. But you always, you always hope that like, if something like that were to happen, it's because it reminded the killer of someone. And there was like an emotional, there's like a a narration, a narrative, a narrative. Thank you. (laughs) English. No, you're good. But, but yeah, but for it's, it's, for it to be a senseless act is just always so much fucking worse in some it way. It is. It's like at least weirdly, in one, at least in one way. You know? It's in one way at least. It's very difficult to swallow. So it, that's exactly what it was. It was just so fucking random. He's like, I just wanted to kill a woman. Uh, he told police he left his sleeping wife at home and drove around looking for a victim. Finally, spotted Kitty in her car, followed her home to her parking lot, um, and despite pleading not guilty by reason of insanity, Mosley was found guilty and sentenced to death uh, with the judge, Erwin uh, Shapiro, commenting, 
I don't believe in capital punishment, but when I see a monster like this, I wouldn't hesitate to pull the switch myself, which that's not mm. quite right in my head. I'm like, you don't believe in the death penalty unless you're emotionally invested. That's not quite how right. that works in my mind. Um, right. So I'm going to call bullshit on that one, but that's besides the point. So he was uh, sentenced to death. However, his initial death sentence was reduced to lifetime imprisonment, uh, to which two additional 15-year sentences were laid on top for crimes he committed when he escaped from custody on March 18th, 1968. Yes, that's right. He escaped. So Mosley had made a getaway when he was being taken uh, back to prison from a Buffalo hospital. He hit a corrections officer, took the man's weapon before fleeing to a nearby vacant house, and when the couple who owned the house checked on their house a few days later, he bound and gagged them and raped the wife, then stole their car, fled to another house where he took a woman and her daughter hostage, left them unharmed after holding them captive for two Thank hours, God. and then surrendered to police shortly thereafter. So I would love to know the psychology behind that thought process of like all of those motions. It, you know? it, it's so wild. It's like it wasn't even like he was trying to get away necessarily it was like he was trying to get away but also inflict the most damage while he did it right it was just like the most chaotic escape ever yeah and you, like you can come up g oh sorry he's being needy i think he has to go potty come here okay there we go do we need to, do we need to take a pee pee break no that's okay it's like eight degrees out so i'll just do it afterward <laughs> it's eight degrees i'm too fucking cold it is it. too <laughs> fucking cold for me to take him out now and after and mm. he doesn't have a yard anymore right or no. he does Oh, no. no. He lives oh. a very tough life. Oh, he's so sheltered. He's it's so sweet, so though. It's so hard to be Gio. Look at the happy little nose. It's so hard to be Gio. I wish he could hear you. I, I he can't. feel... Gio! I wish he could hear you. Uh, is it high-pitched high enough that he gets it? No, it might um, break my ears, though. It's probably for the best he can't hear me, because I'd probably get him riled you up. You would rile him up, yeah. Does he still um, know my voice? Oh pff, no, he forgot about it. Well, because when, when we when we FaceTime, he seems unbothered, and I'm offended. <laughs> That's <laughs> what he does. <laughs> he's that's, like, it's like I thought we got away from you. What the yeah, fuck are we doing here? Yeah, that's his normal attitude problem. Don't worry. So sweet. The little top of his head is so I good. Know. He's gonna Mwah. bother me for the next hour. Um. So anyway, he escaped in a very chaotic fashion. Uh, then he was taken back to prison and then in the days immediately following, uh, okay, sorry. So he was taken back to prison. Blah. End. Got it. In the days immediately following the murder of Kitty, the story didn't get much coverage. It was only until NYPD commissioner Michael J. Murphy took uh, a New York Times editor, A.M. Rosenthal, for lunch where Murphy told Rosenthal that that queen story is one for the books. And that's when the Times launched a full investigative report, which culminated in an article. Maybe this is where you'll... (laughs) <laughs> figure this out published on march 27th called 38 who saw a murder didn't call the police no sound familiar no okay All is right. this like the grinch are you on to something no. and you're waiting for me to like finally catch it <laughs> da, who, da. i'm gonna start singing it. <laughs> um no, no i don't know what this is yet okay i well, feel i feel bad i'm sure no, now i feel bad because like, i'm like putting you on the spot over and over again i'm sure a lot of people are like how the fuck do you not no, know about this? probably not i just thought you would specifically you'll see why okay okay so as later referenced in june 1988 by author harlan ellison uh in a an article for the magazine of fantasy and science fiction quote the murder was witnessed by 38 neighbors, not one of whom made the slightest effort to save her, to scream at the killer, or even to call the police. Hmm. So we know that's not technically true um, based on but the above Is info. that where 38 comes from, too? All the all the witnesses? Yeah. So the New York Times article, the headline was 38 who saw murder didn't call the police. And so got, then okay, got it. Duh. later it was referenced in other magazines, other articles. Um, And this author or this journalist cited reports he claimed to have read that one man, quote, viewing the murder from his third floor apartment window, stated later that he rushed up to turn his radio so he wouldn't hear, turn up his radio so he wouldn't hear the woman's screams. (laughs) Okay. Um, Yikes. Uh, Yikes. However, in police reports, I will say, one witness said his father did call the police after the initial attack and told the police there was a woman being beat up, but then she got up and was staggering around. 
And additionally, a few minutes after the final attack, another witness named Carl Ross called two friends for advice on what to do, which is like, hmm, <laughs> fun little detour you took there. <laughs> okay. Uh called two friends to ask what to do the second of whom called a third friend who eventually called the police who arrived at the scene <laughs> that is not how you handle an emergency <laughs> no that is so many phone calls there okay so in my apartment obviously there's like a crisis every goddamn day <laughs> but uh we've called the police a lot in our at our and like luckily nothing's ever like been happening to us but we just happen to be in a weird pocket of burbank where like we've had a lot of people in the streets at different times saying call the police call the police oh, and it's like i don't even know what the situations are i don't know if they're fights i don't know what what's happening but i've had to call the police a lot and the and the the sense of urgency that you get when you hear someone saying call the police you don't have time to call one person and then wait for it to fucking ring forever and then it hang up and then you call a second person and then they're like hang on let me call my buddy you don't have that fucking That's time like the wildest chain of events it's like so the first one was like i don't know i gotta go it's like well yeah get the fuck it's like uh, yeah i can't okay so i'm already kind of lost here but i'm okay I'm i've only ever so called nine one one for ambulance there were so many ambulances an ambulance I to, I, i've so never called many. for an ambulance it happened in la constantly at the los Feliz apartment i called four separate times for like really really terrible car accidents oh, i saw remember that the, lady that, that mm-hmm. old lady not the one across the street who flipped the car the old lady the who, one who got hit by a car she got hit by a car and flew like fucking 30 yards and i had to stand there and measure it for like paramedics it was horrifying anyway well what about the one where like they like almost like ran through a window or something yeah like, they like- ran they Dr- these two drunk girls drove into a bunch of trash cans, hit the curb, flipped their car upside down. I called 911. Blaze ran outside and, like, pulled them out of the car upside down. And when he pulled them out, the one girl kept going, wait, can I go back and get my iPhone? And he was like, Ugh. fucking sit down. <laughs> like, you just got pulled out of a wrecked car upside down and you're wasted. Jeez. Like, sit down. It was horrible. At least he's like, he knows what he's doing medical wise. Like, yeah, I know. He was like, just can you imagine? sit here. He's like, I drove an ambulance for, thank God he didn't drive an ambulance in LA, but he drove an ambulance for years in Cincinnati. That was its own drama. Anyway, wow. Anyway, sorry. sorry. No, no. Oh, <laughs> we're in a Aww. different echelon. No, you're too cute. No, you're cuter. Um, oh. No, but my my point was, I've as someone who has sent the urgent cry of needing to call the police, like to hear that this guy was like, "What do I do?" and like took probably ten minutes out of like you don't have ten minutes. You don't have ten minutes. Yeah. So again, you're right. You're right on track here. So um, let's see. It was actually later discovered, in fact, that. Uh, through follow-up investigations that the March 27th article in the New York Times was not wholly correct and not wholly fair to the extent that the number 38 had been like completely hyperbolized uh, and some facts had been completely made up um, just like sensationalized journalism, quote unquote journalism. Um, Like I said, two people did call the police. Several of the witnesses interviewed claimed they didn't realize the screams were cries for help. Some people thought, uh, she, they just heard yelling and thought she was in an argument. They weren't sure from their apartment what they were hearing. Um, not that that doesn't, you know, necessarily excuse it fully, but like it actually, it explains it a little bit. Like, I didn't know she was being stabbed to death or I would have called the police. I thought she was having an right. argument with her boyfriend or something. <clears throat> um, so in 2016, I've actually talked about this in the Lululemon murder episode. The New York Times itself called its own reporting flawed. So it mm. they, they came back in 2016 and were like, hey, we have to correct ourselves and say, like, that was bad journalism. Um, stating that the original story grossly exaggerated the number of witnesses and what they had perceived in actuality, only a few people physically saw Kitty Genovese and her attacker. The others just heard her screams. Not great, but, you know, still not correct in the article. And uh, Kitty's brother, William, later created a movie called The Witness that delves into this. And I will tell you wow. why this is so important, like why this has be, been addressed so much. So this obviously opens like a whole ethical can of worms. It opens like... Can you blame the neighbors who didn't call police, even if they knew she was di- – like, who's at blame here? Um, it, 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 like, opens up a whole can of worms of, like, obviously the guy who stabbed the woman is guilty. But then it's, like, what about right. the people who heard her screaming like, and didn't do anything or turned like up the Like, the radio? distribution of responsibility of, like right. – Because there – I mean, there's so many – what was that – 
I feel like everyone learned it in like Psych 101 in college. But like if something ding were ding to happen, ding 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 ding. <laughs> Hello, that's the oh. story. Oh, it's a Kitty Genovese. That like, is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now I get it. <laughs> okay. I was like, now you're I gonna connect the dots at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Psych well, 101, yeah, you, baby. <laughs> you always learn that, like, if you don't point at someone and say do this or like if someone isn't like if you're not assigned a task everyone's gonna like wait around for someone else to do it and then nobody does it. yeah it's and like a diffusion of responsibility exactly there it is diffusion of responsibility right? I, I don't know if that's correct that's kind of a word i just made up but we'll get to the real words that are actually psych words that i'm not making up shortly when i stumble upon the correct bullet um this but- is so fun i mean this is terrible but like okay i get i'm on you. i'm, I'm glad on you i'm it. glad you get it now i'm like yeah. when were we gonna hook you okay so i you, you should have just said the i think it is diffusion of responsibility is like the 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 coined term of like i think it's a like different the word but it's a, it starts with a d i know it starts with a d okay have- we'll get to it <sighs> no 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 it's the bystander effect Okay. Bystander effect. I think diffusion or distribution of responsibility Maybe is part, is of, part that of that it. definition. That would anyway. make sense. Obviously, ethical can of worms. That's where I got you. I said ethical can of worms and then diffusion of responsibility. Okay. It, it, we got there. We, we got, got there. there. So although what happened to Kitty obviously was a fucking tragedy, um, the shock of what happened to her shook not only the people of New York and honestly, but the whole world to do some introspection. So one thing I want to point out, which kind of gets at what you were saying earlier, is there was no 911 back then. You couldn't just call 911. Oh, do you know what right. I mean? Okay. Okay. So that adds a whole layer of like, well, if it's way more complicated to get emergency services, like, does that add anything to it? Or, to you know, like, if you don't know how to reach the police or... Wow, so you really just let me fly through that no, tangent. No, no, it, because it's a good, <laughs> but it's a good point because that's where people argue of like, well, they should have taken the time to find the police right. number, but maybe that's what that guy was doing, calling his friend, saying, "What's the number for the police station?" Who right. knows? Okay, gotcha. You don't know, but you could, they could also have called the operator and asked for police. Mm-hmm. So it, it's like. It's very up in the air, and that's why. So there was no 911 emergency calling, and actually this case uh, became the catalyst to creating an emergency response system in the United (gasps) States. Wow! Yeah, so that's when they were like, crap, like, we need a phone number to call because all these people are like... We need a hotline. I'm just gonna... Yeah, we just... I'm just gonna uh, turn up my radio, I guess. Like, you know, there needs to be a number to call. So, uh... Isn't that so wild that at one point there was, like, a... A, like a mindset of like well there's nothing i can do might as well ignore the trauma of like, yeah like, well and if you think it's like the city like in new york and like so much shit goes down every day it's like you hear screaming it's not necessarily like the only time right. you've heard someone screaming in the streets of new york um, right, again right, not that right, that makes right. it right but it's just like maybe that's something you're more used it's, to or it might have been just part of the culture of like you hear a loud noise and you ignore it and like yeah maybe it didn't even register as a scream at first or you know? if you like a lot of them said they thought she was in an argument or they didn't realize it was cries for help so it, right. it gets very iffy um very gray area so up until the 60s there was no centralized number for people to call in case of an emergency if you did need to call the police or the fire department you would call the nearest station by number like you'd have to call their wow. phone number yeah or you had to call zero. <laughs> people who are older than us are like yeah Duh. yeah i know wow <laughs> or you had to call zero to reach an operator and say i need this right. the local police which again is a whole nother step added to this process right. um and so it took three years after her murder before the u.s took steps to create 911 but President Lyndon Johnson's um, Commission on Law Enforcement and Administration of Justice, they love those long names, uh, issued a report <laughs> recommending that citizens have the ability to contact police departments using one single telephone number. And that's when it all kind of began. So AT&T in 1968, um, which at the time nearly operated nearly all telephone connections in the U.S., deci- decided to establish a 911 line. So that was in 1968. Now, I'm... What? I was going to ask oh. you a trivia question. I was going to say, I was going to ask why? you a trivia question. <laughs> do you know why they tri- picked 911? Is what I was. I was ask. literally going to ask, why did they pick 911? I wrote guess because I knew you were going to ask me, and I wrote guess exclamation um, point. <laughs> well, my first thought was I was thinking of rotary phones, but nine is so fucking far away. Like, is it nine or it's one? One was the one that's far. What's no, no, no. Is- nine's a f- or zero is the farthest, but yeah. So nine. I would it think only like- takes like point five seconds if someone's in your house though 
that trip from nine all the way to the click that's a, that's a we long talked distance. about this once and somebody literally dm me and said there was a case of a woman who died while dialing on her rotary number for nine <laughs> and i was like you would oh. think like one 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 would be the one but that's but, way too close to accidentally butt dialing in my is, opinion is that why they did it then because like nine was like an intentional one versus two quick ones i don't know why so here we go they wanted a number that was short Easy mm-hmm. to remember, so okay, unique. And 911 had never been used as an area code before or any sort oh. of uh, code before any phone number, so it was like completely unique, brand new. Um, and so it could be taken as like a totally separate. I mean, I'm not saying 111 wasn't, I don't know, but I feel like 111 is a lot easier to like accidentally in my mind butt dial which i'm sure you didn't butt dial on a rotary phone because that would require a lot of gymnastic effort <laughs> a lot of a lot of twerking on your receiver i'm telling yeah. you yeah it'd be a lot of really delicate <laughs> butt movements which i don't have the ability to do um but in my mind one 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 seems a little i mean isn't that what is it in um now i'm gonna look like a real idiot okay never mind i'm not gonna go there <laughs> oh well no that's interesting imagine being the person who had to go th- like comb through every goddamn area code to find the one that's different than everything else <laughs> i know and it's so taken for granted like 911 you know like you don't ever yeah. think about it so they really it really was not um ergonomically friendly though in terms of how far that nine is on the rotary yeah because they they really weren't taking into account like the you have a split fucking second to call the yeah. cops i do like your your notion though that it's it's intentional though it's not like Maybe what like I the don't last know. two are real quick, but the first one you have to like commit to. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know either. But anyway. but it was mostly because it was easy to remember, short, and wasn't used in any other context before. Interesting. Yeah. So, and what? Oh, A and AT and T. Okay. Cool. Yeah, and they figured. I mean, to be fair though, if you were using a rotary phone back then, you were dialing seven numbers. So nine one one is still a lot shorter than dialing the local police station do you know what i mean i i wonder why they didn't just do two numbers like what was the three about you know i don't think anything's two numbers is it <laughs> well it was anything before that zero. <laughs> was anything before that three numbers like well i know the operator is zero so i don't know you would think if zero is the operator then like nine could have just been the police and like that was all, like i feel like nine one one is much more unique though because if you're like nine one that could be like nine one seven or like oh right I don't know. I feel like nine one one is just its own unique combination that you can't really. We're really. I'm. I'm like still in like QAnon mindset oh where I'm trying to find reasons for every goddamn thing. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't continue. That's very interesting. It's I short number, that. easy to remember. Yada yada. So, um, fun fact: February sixteenth, nineteen sixty eight, was the first nine one one call ever made. It, huh. I know. This is where it gets real fun. It was made out of Haleyville, Alabama. The town is extremely proud of this. Uh, apparently it was a ceremonial call between two Alabama politicians, but <laughs> nonetheless, each year since the city celebrates with the Haleyville 911 festival, which features live music and lots of food. So can you imagine being a cop in that town being like, <laughs> this festival is about me yeah. like that. or the dispatch? Like finally right. my phone number gets some recognition. <laughs> this is my moment. Yeah. Either way, as said by Kevin Cook, who wrote a book about Kitty Genovese, uh, called Kitty Genovese, the murder, the bystanders, the crime that changed America quote, the 911 system grows more or less directly from the outcry from Kitty Genovese's death. So Kitty Genovese also inspired the creation of a neighborhood watch program and other reforms, oh. including crime victim compensation, sex offender registries, and laws that allow victims families to speak during the penalty uh, phase in felony trials according to cook and there are cases that i've covered that more i would say more directly led to like the sex offender registry for example um but this case was definitely like a starting point for all of pivotal those. is pivotal yes pivotal great word so the murder of kitty also piqued the interest of quite a few psychologists Mm -hmm. Um, As mentioned above, although it wasn't quite 38 people who could have prevented her murder, uh, Kitty's girlfriend at the time, Mary Ann Zelanko, reflected in a 20, I'm sorry, a 2004 interview saying, I still have a lot of anger toward people because they could have saved her life. I mean, all the steps along the way when he attacked her three times and then he sexually assaulted her too when she was dying. I mean, you look out the window, see this happening and you don't help. How do you live with yourself knowing you didn't do anything? So now yeah. this is where you start wondering, like, well, why didn't people intervene? Like, if they're seeing this, why didn't they do something? 
And of course, there's like the issue of like, well, you don't want to put yourself in, in danger. But there's, I think, more to it, like you were saying, that uh, the the murder of Kitty Genovese sparked this insight into the the what they call now the bystander effect. And it's it's this it it got people thinking like, how did this happen? That so many people they can't all just be vicious assholes. Like there has to be some reason that this group of people presumably yeah. from all different walks of life and different, you know, families and whatever, all kind of sat around and didn't yeah. do anything. Yeah, is it just like the assumption that someone else will kind That's of a big pave part the way? Of it. Yeah, it's like that, well, I shouldn't be responsible. Someone else is going to be responsible. Um, yeah. and it's or someone, even... else, someone else might be more experienced yes, than this yeah, me. Yes, like, exactly. Like if there was a, I would, I mean, it's like a, now it's like a, a thing, like it's understood. So I don't feel stupid or bad about saying this, but if I saw a car accident, and it, like I don't know if I would react properly. Like first of all, there's fight or flight, and I'm definitely f- flight. But I mean, if I were amongst a group, I'd be like someone else might be Blaze, like a doctor, or like <laughs> well, not a doctor, but you know, like in medical training, who is better equipped for this? Or someone might be, um, you know, I'm not the person meant for this task. But see, but if everyone's think, thinking that, then it's like exactly, who is then nothing the happens. Yeah, because yeah. Blaze could be thinking, well, there might be an, uh, a surgeon who could, you know, whatever. Or Did, wasn't there? I really keep going on t- off tangents here, but I, when I we first started becoming friends, didn't Blaze do some sort of like weird like physical medical training where they like taught you how to respond quickly to shit like this? And there was like a oh gosh, I don't. I, I feel like I remember him going like on a like doing some sort of retreat or something when he was <laughs> oh, still God. in. Um, I, I can ask him. Probably that sounds like something he would sign up for, but I definitely don't remember. It was something to prevent things like this, where it was like, it, it trained him early to like, if something happens, respond because nobody else oh. will. Okay, I'll I ask like him. We talk- I don't know. Anyway, sorry. I should remember, but I don't. Um, I'll ask him later. So that author, Kevin Cook, uh, was quoted saying, on one hand, the crime stirred something primal, the terror of being alone in the dark when a predator strikes. But the story also captured a modern anxiety, too. The fear that you might have a thousand neighbors only to die alone while they stood by their windows watching. Whoa. Shivery. And just uh, like that, in years to come, psychology textbooks would begin to attach Kitty's name to concepts like pluralistic ignorance and the bystander effect, Mm. terms used to describe how people can lose their moral compass in a crowd. Yep. So the term bystander effect refers to the phenomenon in which the greater the number of people present, the less likely people are to help a person in distress. So when an emergency situation occurs, observers are more likely to take action if there are few or no other witnesses. Uh, But being a part of a large crowd makes it so no single person has to take responsibility. And I think a lot of that is subconscious, obviously, which is why it's studied so in depth. But um, it's not like, oh, well, I'm not responsible. It's more of like, a oh, like you said, like, oh, I'm sure someone else has got this handled. And you don't even necessarily think about it consciously. Um, I also want to add that this is a somewhat controversial theory. Like, I have heard i don't know whatever we'll get into i wasn't it. taught anything different but i was also taught a long time ago so if there's <laughs> we're anything, old now <laughs> if there's any uh, opposition to it i just don't know it so. i remember when we studied it i don't know why but our professor was like here are the reasons against it and like told us oh so i i remember hearing that and i will say i do want to correct myself i'll mention this at a, uh, later probably but i'll just say now um that i want to correct myself in that lululemon episode i called it like a myth or something and like that was not the right terminology um it's kind of it's been debunked that this that her case was as extreme of an example for the reasons i said people did call the police there was no easy way to call the police people thought she was having an argument obviously somebody could have helped so that's besides the point. But it wasn't sure. as hyperbolic and extreme as the original New York Times article said of 38 people just stood there and watched her get stabbed to death, especially because the mm-hmm. crime happened in two locations. One was outside. One was inside. That's so wild because the story of the bystander effect that I was taught literally in college in an e- in an education institution was that this – it must have been for like flare effect or something, but uh, was that – someone in the middle of like a busy street got stabbed to death and everyone just watched it fucking happen. Yeah, that's like, what a- this story was. Like that's what the story was presented yeah. by the New York Times is like 38 witnesses on this New York City street turned yeah. up their radio and ignored it and it wasn't quite that extreme, but that is which is why I 
I misquoted uh, it saying or mislabeled it. it as a myth. That's not the right word. Um, so I was wrong in that instance. But it is there is definitely some controversy surrounding like the legitimacy of the original story, which the New York Times even said like. No, we did terrible journalism. But obviously, this is a very, I think, a real effect that takes place. And some people do argue against that as well. But whatever, we're going to go with it. So anyway, so the notion of uh, the bystander effect and why we continue to look away in the face of danger remains a very uh, real phenomenon that still occurs to this day, like you were saying. Um, It was first addressed because of what happened to Kitty Uh, Ten days later, after Kitty's murder, psychologist John Darley had lunch with another psychologist, Bib (laughs) Latanay, and they discussed the incident, (laughs) saying the newspaper explanations were focusing on the appalling personalities of those who saw the murder but didn't intervene, saying they had been dehumanized by living in an urban environment. We wanted to see if we could explain the incident by drawing on the social psychological principles that we knew. So instead of being like, these are just asshole urban folks who just don't care about a young woman. And it's like there's more to it than that and right. it's a human instinct rather than like it's just these 38 assholes <laughs> um so darley and latine published a series of papers in 1969 looking at what would later be known more famously as the bystander effect sometimes known as the kitty effect which is also how i learned oh. it um they wanted to show why the witnesses to kitty's murder behaved with quote apathy whether they could quantify a minimum number of people present to create that kind of like indecision so like is it when there's five people is it when there's 20 people that like you lose that instinct to respond um so they they figure it out they did these yeah so they did like very specific experiments which are so interesting and like i love this shit so In 1968, they asked participants to sit on their own, like just by themselves in a room, and complete a questionnaire on the pressures of urban life. But in reality, what they were going to do is pump smoke, but it was actually steam, but it looked like smoke was coming through a small vent in the wall into the room. Sorry. Uh, Was that Geo? Yeah, he's fighting with the cats and... He sounded like a puppy. Yeah, Mooney probably scratched <coughs> much deservedly because he's being a real jerk. Um, <laughs> so they, they were sitting in a room alone and smoke, quote unquote, started filling the room. Within two minutes, 50% of people who were in the room alone had taken action and 75% acted within six minutes. Wow. So that was pretty quick. But in groups of three participants, so if you're in a room with two other people, 62% carried on working for the entire experiment without saying a word whoa i know that's Isn't so that wild? wild you're so yeah. affected by other people which makes sense and like i'm sure i've been in that boat a million times where you're like well no one else is freaking out so right i guess no, it's truly. fine <laughs> you don't want to yeah. be that guy <laughs> you don't want to be the paranoid one yeah one of my favorite story or psychology studies was where they did the different lengths of the lines have you seen that it's they had like different length lines on a poster or something and they had a group of people and Oh, yes, yes. I know what you're talking about. There was only <clears throat> one who was not a plant. Like, who's not Got it. a part. Like, they were trying to, they they asked people, like, are these lines the same or different? Is that what you're yeah, talking or about? it was like, which one's longer or something? Or, yeah, it was something like that. Like, a very basic, obvious question. But there was only one person in the room who was actually a study participant. And everybody else was, like, a plant, I guess. And they, I yeah. think, if I'm remembering correctly. And everybody in the room said, oh, like, the top one's shorter when obviously it wasn't and so they studied this and almost every single study participant agreed with the rest of the group even if it was obviously the wrong answer which is just so fascinating to me it's like you don't want to just say the opposite because you're like maybe i'm missing something it really like it's got to be just like a such a not like a human instinct yeah. like a fear of rejection or like being like part of the part group of, yeah part of the group or i mean i i imagine like primitively like we're supposed to be part of the pack oh my God, right? you're not going to so. disagree and like be right the outcast exactly yeah exactly yeah. i just think that's so fascinating so it's the same idea um in interviews afterward participants reported feeling hesitant about showing anxiety so they looked to others for signs of anxiety but since everyone was trying to appear calm the signs were not evident <laughs> so they misinterpreted the situation they thought they were misinterpreting the situation and redefined it as safe because they were like no one else is freaking out so it's, it's just, just like a it's just a, literally a room of anyone today it's just like a bunch of anxiety-ridden people all being like this is fine i'm like- fine <laughs> i got this 
handled. And it's like, does anyone else feel this way? No. Yeah, completely. It's like on Instagram when you're like, everyone else has their shit together. No, no, we're all lying. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. So in interview, uh, but oh, sorry, I said that. A few years later, Darley ran a study with uh, psychologist Daniel Batson that saw a student. This is horrifying. I've, ugh. So it had students at Princeton walk across campus to give a talk that they were scheduled to do. So mm-hmm. along the way, the students would pass a person slumped over and groaning in a passageway. This was an actor used for the study. The experiment was conducted, and it seemed there was only one factor that influenced whether someone stopped to help the person. Do you have a guess as to what the factor was? Now, I... Uh... Is it something really horrible? Like they had like money hanging out of their pocket or something? What? <laughs> they were late for their presentation. <laughs> if they what? were running late, they wouldn't stop. If they were on time, they were m- much more likely to stop. And Interesting. Help. Right? Isn't that wild? So only 10% of students stopped when they were in a hurry. More than six times as many helped to stop when they had enough time to get to their talk. Well, I guess that means I'm a raging, You're consistent in asshole. Because <laughs> I'm late to everything, so I guess I would help zero people. <laughs> just like blinders on. <laughs> you know, that reminds me of, um, remember a while ago, at this point maybe, it's got to have been over a year ago, Allison and I were watching uh, that show, The Stanley who wants to be a superhero or the Stanley prison experiment? Wait, what's no, 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 no. Prison experiment? no, Stan Lee from Marvel. Oh, Stan Lee. Okay. Sorry. When, remember he made the, the TV show who wants to be a superhero or do you want to be a superhero or something? No. We talked oh, about you, Oh, with kids. Yeah. 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 Right. It was uh, the last season was with kids oh. and the other ones were like adults, but okay, yeah. um, it was way ahead of its time. If it existed when like the Marvel Cinematic Universe was a thing, this would be like fucking the newest American Idol. But it was way early on and like totally flopped. But that's part of what makes it hysterical is they would give people who like wanted to be a superhero, like superhero tasks. And one of them happened to be that there was like a little girl lost and crying, but that happened to be a plant in the middle of the environment where they were supposed to do a completely different <gasps> task because That's so smart so like the a true hero would have stopped and helped the little yeah. girl instead of like finished the race that they they had no idea this little girl was a plant they just thought they had to race through like a market square well it's like the same idea actually- where they were like you have to go give this presentation and you're running late yeah. for this presentation that's the study and then it's like and since it was yeah mm-hmm. since it was a race it was like you are already basically late because you have to beat someone exactly. else's time and there was only like one or two people out of all of the superheroes in this race who stopped to help the little girl exactly so it's like when there's a sense of urgency about something yep. else it seems to just like completely blind that instinct which is fascinating so uh lateness and the presence of other people in this case are some of the factors that can apparently turn all of us into bystanders in an emergency Mm. so another important factor which what a shock not is the physical characteristics of the person needing help which Uh. is awful but true and not a surprise so research has shown that people are more likely to help those they perceive to be similar to them including others from their own racial or ethnic groups um, you've probably Aww. seen a million videos like this demonstrating the element of the bystander effect. Like there's one video where actors of different demographics are uh, and wearing certain clothes to denote wealth lie seemingly unconscious or in pain on the street. And the production company times how long it takes for someone to intervene. Um, spoiler alert, the public will check in on cis men in a suit in the shortest amount of time. Not shocking. Uh, according Excellent. To, <laughs> according now to... If I see, now if I see a cis man lying on the street, I'll be like, the other 20 people can grab <laughs> that guy. Someone else can handle this. <laughs> I have a girl to save from a fire or whatever. Right. <laughs> um, I'm late, actually, to Christine's house to record. Um, right. According to... Side note, side note, we will save someone if they're hurt. Yes, we, that's, like, that's like being I'm facetious. joking. Being facetious, I promise. Yes. Um, according to a mental health website called verywellmind.com, which I actually really like and recommend you check out, uh, there are two major factors that contribute to the bystander effect. First, the presence of other people creates a diffusion of responsibility. Okay, so I didn't make it up. I read it and then regurgitated it. Yeah, that's like the only part of it I remember. That's <laughs> diffusion ten of years. responsibility. It sounds so smart. I was so proud of myself okay um (laughs) because there are other observers individuals do not feel as much pressure to take action the responsibility to act is thought to be shared among all of those present 
The second reason is the need to behave in correct and socially acceptable ways, which I know I'm very guilty of, of this same idea of like, well, I don't want to be the one person who acts mm-hmm. differently and makes a scene if everyone right. else says this is fine. So I'm definitely guilty of that. Um, so when other observers fail to react, individuals often take this as a signal that a response is either not needed or not appropriate. And like, it's very, I think, hard for some people, including myself, to override that feeling of, well, I don't want to be inappropriate socially and cause a scene sure um so i get especially that. especially if you're socialized you know, totally totally if you're if you were socialized as female growing right. up then you're much more likely were... to try and fit the mold yeah to try and yeah. stay be <laughs> under calm, their... being calm quiet polite don't disturb society or in other <laughs> words dis- not hysterical <laughs> don't be hysterical uh-huh. don't don't get in the in the men's way, you Don't know, get as in the you way. do. Stay yeah. quiet. Yeah. Um, so researchers have found that onlookers are less likely to intervene if the situation is ambiguous. So in the case of Kitty Genovese, like I said, many witnesses reported they believed they were witnessing a lover's quarrel, did not realize she was being murdered. Um, other psychologists, including Joachim Kruger, have gone on to prove how the bystander effect actually affects us on a day-to-day basis. So he says, it's the volunteer dilemma. If there are 7 billion people who could save the world, why should it be me? So it's like, if you're about to, should yeah. I wash out this bottle and recycle it? Well, think about all the other people on the planet who aren't. Or why should I be the one who has to do this? There are so right. many other people. I mean, it's that same idea of like, if everybody... But the bystander- it can even happen, like, the bystander effect can happen when the group of people aren't even that's there. That's true. Cause... And it's, like, a virtual or, like, mentally. Yeah. yeah, that's so true when you're not even in the same place. Um, so this can apply to much bigger world issues. Uh, you're probably expecting this, everybody, but the Holocaust, Rwandan genocide, climate crisis, very easy to not feel responsible for recycling or saving the planet if you're like well there's a bunch of other people who could do this better than me or and so you don't do your part and it's very common so these findings force us to consider how we'd perform under pressure um they reveal that kitty genovese's neighbors might have acted in the same way we would have not because they're urban assholes or whatever the new york times says but just because that is human nature um, it, however, it is important, again, like I said earlier, the crime, the real crime is the man who raped and stabbed her, Winston Mosley. Yes. So I don't want to, like, forget that fact. However, um, that being said, it is widely believed that someone could have prevented her death. So then it becomes, like, morality, ethics, can of worms again of, like, well, then who's responsible? Obviously, the killer's responsible, but, like, what if someone could who's have stopped the- it? Who's the aftermath responsibility fall on? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or like, if you could have stopped it, are you also murder a murderer? Like, I don't know. It's like... It's like a survivor's guilt. It's like a... In some ways, it's a survivor's guilt, I think. At least if you were one of those people or if you're like the mad friend who's upset with all the bystanders because it's like, you could have saved her and you didn't and therefore I blame you. Yeah, yeah. It's like there's some sort of, of blame on you where you were in the wrong place at the wrong time you weren't planning on murdering anybody but like maybe you could have intervened and then i mean in my head it goes to the whole trolley problem of like well am i a murderer if i prevent these people from dying but i kill this person but that's a whole nother thing so we'll get to that another day probably not (laughs) anxiety is fun isn't it (laughs) Ah, spiraling help okay so one source called making queer history notes it's interesting that in a story used to highlight the ways people ignore each other kitty herself usually goes by unnoted Um, Mm. So a little bit about Kitty herself, born July 7th, 1935 in Brooklyn, uh, went to an all-girls high school, and her senior year quote was, the class cut up. That's Kitty. She's quite a gal, you know, always doing things for a laugh, like going swimming in the snow. (laughs) She sounds like a gem. Um, After high school, she lived with her grandparents for a while. Uh, She married a military cadet in 1954, but it was annulled within a year. And this was a shock to her family. But once she was independent, Kitty took full advantage of her newfound freedom. She found her calling as a barmaid. And the picture she's most recognized for, uh, the picture that's attached to the famous article about her murder, is ironically a mugshot, uh, which was taken in 1961 for bookmaking, a.k.a. gambling, (laughs) because she ran a small betting system out of her bar. She sounds like a goddamn blast. She was. Yeah, she was. Uh, She took patrons' money for horse racing. She was known for her skill and good humor. Um, and she had actually been brought into the police station for that and le- let go, like, right away because she was just very charming and, like, easy to, you know, dismiss. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, 
it was a minor charge and one that she kept as a secret from her family back in Connecticut, which makes it extra sad that they used that photo dur- right. after her death as like the photo, the shocking photo. Um, so she also lived in a neighborhood that wasn't like super dangerous or anything. Unlike what the article said, people left their doors unlocked. Um, people on in the area knew her. They saw her come and go from work. She went out to dinner with them every now and then. Uh, and they knew her roommate, Mary Anzalanco, who I also already mentioned was her girlfriend, uh, as another bartender who painted on the weekends. Like I've kind of hinted, they were not just roommates. Um, they had met at a place called The Swing Rendezvous, which was a lesbian Hey-o. bar run by a woman named Mitch at the time. And Marianne was called <laughs> to identify Kitty's... This sounds like... Um, God, what's that TV show? Okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, the anyway. L word? What? <laughs> uh, never mind. Um, I'm sorry. I, the lesbian bartender named Mitch just really got I know. Me. Isn't this like, just like, it just sounds like, like deliciously a queer. I know. Just it sounds so like delicious. a script of like a, a, a fun HBO quirky drama. I love drama. it. Yeah, I, I love it too. I want to I wanna play Mitch. Wait a minute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, boy. Nobody gets murdered in our version though. Right. Um, no, 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 no. So Marianne was called to identify Kitty's body after her murder, uh, was given little by comfort uh, by the officers who accompanied her. She said, they took me down to the police station in Queens and for six hours they questioned me. So at the same time, or sorry, at the time, same sex partners were often immediately suspected in violent crimes on an assumed motive of jealousy. Uh, So that's a cute look. Um, It was just assumed that same-sex couples were more jealous of each other and caused them to murder each other okay 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 Okay, calm down same-sex partners were also questioned for longer and on less evidence than heterosexual partners again not shocking sounds right police were as likely to arrest them as to help them and remember in 1964 homosexuality was actually a crime still under new york law uh so this wasn't even something you could defend yourself with um, right. So Marianne took the stand as a legal <clears throat> witness under the guise of a friend and roommate. Uh, prosecutors knew the truth. However, they were afraid that if they brought Kitty's sexuality into it, that it would sway the jury, which is a mm. fair point. It's not yeah. great, but if they're going to judge her differently on it, like, okay, I guess if we're trying to pin her murder, I don't know. That's another right. can of worms, I guess. Oh, this is a whole wormy, so full of worms. This is just a lot of lot of entanglement it's happening a here. Factory of worms. Okay, so <laughs> let's see. If we're talking about worm factories here, let's talk about trolley and the. I, I would love a good gummy worm right uh, now. No, they may make those out of gelatin. You got to eat a non-gelatin gummy worm, otherwise you're eating horse hooves. All right, whatever. It's it's easy to ignore it when it's delicious. I, uh-huh, I that sounds very interesting, uh, Mr. Cult situation, Mr. Bystander effect. Well, okay, if everyone I else know, is eating I them, know. okay. Anyway, I have like four points left. I'm not. I don't want to start a um a crusade against M right now. I like no um, I like gummy me. worms, and that is probably you want to eat not a sour patch kit or Skittle. No. Or sour, okay. oh, or sour patch. We'll talk about this later. Oh, I, could, I have. I could. Twizzlers, I could be sour patch, Skittles. Okay, we'll get to it. Um. Okay. I'm. Look how easy that was. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> Just do your research. Okay. I'll, I know. I'll God send damn it. it. Later. <laughs> <laughs> um. I'll send you my source. Wink. Okay. Right. 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 So anyway, homosexuality was a sin. Uh, not a sin. It is a sin in a lot of places. It is a crime at that time under New York law. Mary, Call me a sinner. <laughs> I do. Not for that reason, but for other reasons. Um. The gummy worms. Yep. <laughs> Uh, so, like I said, Marianne took the stand as a legal witness under the guise of a friend or a roommate. Um, they didn't want the killer to get off with a lighter sentence because people had preconceived notions and judgments. So it is pretty wild to think that Kitty was basically unknown who and only became like an international and like uh, public figure and source in to this day that's recognized in the field of psychology after her death, which is just so right. wild to think like it wasn't until she died that she became such a huge name. Um, so this is a, a great quote by Harold Takushian, who has, who has a PhD um, in an article for the general psychologist. He said, Kitty is known only for the last 28 minutes of her life, not the first 28 years. Wow. Which is like very powerful in my mind. Um, and if you do want to find out more, uh, there's a book called Kitty Genovese, The Murder, the Bystanders, the Crime that Changed America. That's the one I've referenced earlier. Um, have not read it. Looks great. 
Um, <laughs> the cover is outstanding. <laughs> I have not had time to read it, but I'm sure it's lovely and I probably will eventually. So that was the story of Kitty Genovese and the bystander effect and how that kind of created 911 Neighborhood Watch. Wow. Like it created a lot of things. Term, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, I... I I had no idea. And now I also, it makes me want to go back and look at like old psychology. I know. I'm like, like you got to check your notes, man. I know. Do my research. Do your obviously. damn research. And not at wow. university. After all. Uh, Unfortunately. No, no, no. Not a credible source. <laughs> well, after uh, after being so like invested I in all this QAnon stuff, I like, I feel like I could say, do your research about just about anything and technically be right. It's so pretty I guess. easy. It's like, if you don't know the answer, you could be like, do your research. And it's like, I yeah, don't fucking know. Come on now. You tell me. Uh, you tell me. But also, like, use the sources that I want you to use. Yes, you know? exactly. You get it. You get it. Anyway, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to <laughs> the only important source, which is And That's Why We Drink. This is uh, your prime source. This and E-Bomb's world. Don't go anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, thank you for putting up with us. us in general and uh we'll see we'll see you next week please come to our live show on the 26th yeah. um and submit your stories again if you would like to uh possibly have our have us read your story on the live show yep and look out for london fog friday also mm-hmm. a good marvel monday tea time tuesday Ugh, I got there's all, a lot so. happening and puts a lot on their plate <laughs> uh, if you want tickets to our show it's on location live.com slash atwwd yay i gotta and? take geo out to pee that's why smooth we uh go pee if we're geo i guess. gotta pee in the and snow drink. you know it's more fun drink. to pee in the snow uh don't drink. eat the yellow I, snow that's where we were trying to go and it didn't happen and don't that's why we drink eat that snow cone okay <laughs> bye bye